Good morning, everyone. I welcome all the eminent speakers, renowned guests, and esteemed audience to the day two of 68th Annual Conference of Indian Association of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery. I think human beings have an innate desire to help each other, whether you are in medicine or anything else. If you see someone that you can help, you get a gratification from doing it. In fact, I think that is perhaps the most important, you might say, fabric that holds our society together. Well, was once quoted by Dr. Michael DeBecky. And with that thought in mind, I, Dr. Ananya Pandey, CTVS resident, on behalf of organizing team of IACTS, offer my regards to all the guests and delegates joining us uh, this morning in the DeBecky Hall. The theme of the conference this year is disseminating knowledge and facilitating skills together. Uh, for the first session of the free paper today, uh, the abstract title is uh, Attitudes, Motivators, and Barriers to a Career in Cardiothoracic Surgery, a cross-sectional -section study among the surgical residents in India, uh, which will be presented by Dr. A. Mohammed Idris. Uh, the session, uh, this session's moderator is Dr. Bridge Mohan Singh. I welcome the moderator to the stage. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you for the opportunity given to me. So this is just to assess the attitude or the motivations or the barriers which the uh, cardiac thoracic, with the resident, surgical residents wanted to have in cardiac surgery. So this is the, uh, the main is to identify that the aim of the study was to identify the reasons which prevented the applicants from pursuing a cardiac surgery. And another one, what are the options for providing this an attractive option? So what we did was we, pro we provided, uh, this is a first of its kind study where uh, previously all this study was done for the CVTS residents. This one we went below, one step below we found, went into the MS general surgery residents or the DNB candidates to assess them. What is their interest in pursuing a super speciality course? So we circulated a Google form. So this had five structures. One is like basic demography. Then what are the factors which influence in them choosing not cardiac surgery? And what are the factors which help them choosing cardiac surgery? And then what are the factors which influence them? any super speciality? And then how do you create an interest in cardiac surgery? So one, four and five sections will be answered by all the participants. And two, that is not choosing cardiac surgery will be option will be uh, will be opted by persons who are choosing there where the primary or secondary option is not cardiac surgery. So it is a five point Likert scale, which we have used. So so the major difficulty which found which we found was there was no database for the MS general surgery students or the cardi or the DNB students across the country. So there was not a single database. So we cannot contact them directly to uh, to get the give them the structure to ask them. So what we did was we con we used the social media like Facebook, WhatsApp, and then started using them. And then the other thing is that we contacted the academic council of uh, Association of Surgeons of India. So if we asked them to circulate to the head of institutes, where from there they will start distributing to the candidates. So we used a snowball sampling like that one after one, then uh, it just keeps on the person. If I answer that goes to the next can, I will circulate to my students. So then my friends, it goes on like this. It's a snowball sampling was done. So the inclusion is like all the potential participants. The potential participants includes all the MS or DNB surgical, I mean, students who wanted to take up the super specialty or the cats to MS general surgery students who are completed and then they want to pursue on higher studies. Consultants are excluded from the studies or the practice, practicing clinicians are excluded from the study. So the results, a total of 618 potential participants was there. So this is the biggest number where, because the previous study on all this across the globe, the, the, there was a meta-analysis recently regarding the same topic from uh, UK, which was showing that uh, the maximum, the mean number was only 126 in that study. So we had the 618 students. So which uh, almost 75% were the males and uh, remaining 25% were females. 
and uh, the preference most of them are on 381 almost more for the five five uh, special which is marked in green are the specialties which is most commonly studied during the mrs general surgery so there the sheet uh, the seat share for the neat exam is around 41% the remaining all is around 59% but the respondents here if you could see not working so if you see the respondents choices as a primary choice if you see that uh, that, that is around 62% are fighting for a 40% seat and remaining 37% are fighting for a 60% of the seats that is how the neat matrix is that the present neat matrix so the syllabus as you see the green color these head and neck head Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have done a study. Uh, in the study, we have uh, uh, described our experience of 16 patients with chronic AF who underwent uh, uh, mitral valve surgery. And uh, this technique is uh, basically uh, a cut and sew technique of uh, the pulmonary vein isolation. Uh, uh, the rationale behind uh, the pulmonary vein isolation is uh, that the ectopic foci of uh, the muscular sleeves of pulmonary veins are responsible for the paroxysmal AFs in 94% of the cases. And this is a point where uh, there is transition of two types of uh, electrical en uh, endothelium, that is one from the pulmonary vein and one from the left atrial endocardium. And uh, this, pot uh, this properties uh, potentiate the development of AF. So, when, uh, so the rationale behind uh, the pulmonary vein isolation is this so that the uh, muscular sleeves are to be isolated from the rest of the age. And uh, who's, uh, who, who was requiring a mitral valve uh, surgery or a, uh, a tricuspid valve uh, surgery. Uh, the AF was uh, at least uh, lasted for six months uh, uh, in which the patients we have operated and we have excluded all the patients with uh, EF of less than 30 and uh, NY. No, So we have basically evaluated the uh, post-operatively, we have basically evaluated uh, the rhythm of the patient with the 12 ED ECG and the atrial mechanical syn uh, synchrony because even though the ECG is showing T wave, sometimes there is only the electrical activity and not the mechanical activity. So we have done a 2D echo to determine the uh, atrial mechanical, uh, electromechanical uh, synchrony. And uh, we have all, all, also uh, determined the left atrial diameter uh, because after PVI, we have observed that there is a significant decrease in the left atrial diameter, which is an additional perquisite. Uh, as the left atrial diameter in a study done by uh, Renato, they have, they have showed that uh, the left atrial diameter of more than 4.5 is, uh, uh, 4.5 mm is, uh, uh, pre, uh, uh, that can actually uh, lead to uh, uh, recurrence of the uh, recurrent AFs. Uh, so, our procedure basically is uh, consisting of a PV encircling incision with or without uh, extension uh, to mitral annulus. We have actually not uh, done that mitral annular incision. We have only done the uh, PV encircling incision. Uh, by the initial primary incision, we have put it on the um, just below the uh, uh, interatrial groove, 1.5 centimeters uh, proximal to the pulmonary veins, right? Pulmonary veins, which we have extended it into the uh, floor of the atria. And then that extended up till the uh, base of the appendage. And the, this uh, incision, which was uh, right, uh, right upper pulmonary vena uh, uh, incision was extended in the transverse sinus. And then it was extended till the base of the appendage, where uh, both of the incisions meet. 
and that incision was extended into the uh, base of the appendage and appendage was excised completely excised and orientation sutures were put and then later that incision was sewn back so that this this encircling incision will not allow the ectopic foci al arising from the pulmonary veins to get transmitted into the atria and after that uh, that interatrial through that interatrial uh, groove incision that which we have kept without suturing we have done the replacement mitral valve replacement and then closed it back and if there is a requirement of tv plasty we have made, uh, made a separate incision in the rv ra and then we have replaced the tri uh, uh, repaired the tricuspid valve this is a pictorial representation of what we have done uh, the first uh, first diagram uh, shows that the P line of pvi incision those are uh, the four P, uh, pulmonary veins that are opening into the antrum of the left atrium. That is the incision uh, put in the interatrial groove, and the RA and the septum are retracted. And uh, you can see that the dotted lines are the representation of the incision. It, they were extended till the base of the uh, LA appendage, and they have been extended to the uh, appendage, and the appendage has been excised. And then the third picture is showing you uh, the suturing back of the incised line and the base of the LA stump. This is the interoperative picture. The first picture you are seeing is through the left, it, uh, the inside of the left atrium, the pulmonary vein, upper pulmonary vein incision. And this we have, uh, we, uh, for usually for uh, the good exposure of uh, LA appendage, we'll have to open the right pleura and push the apex of the heart into the right pleura and then excise it. That is the uh, stump of the appendage. And uh, the advantage of ex excising the uh, LA appendage is uh, that, that there is a uh, paper done by Jang uh, et al, where they have told that there will be a little window open, even though if you ligate or put a device from where their uh, stasis, the, uh, whatever uh, thrombus is there in the LA will later on uh, dislodge into the circulation and can cause thromboembolic events. And uh, that is where our uh, procedure has an advantage of uh, preventing all those post-operative strokes. So our results, uh, mainly, we have concentrated on the left atrial diameter, as I've told you, that uh, pre -op the mean the preoperative uh, left atrial diameter was 54 uh, mm, which, which had uh, reduced significantly to 43 mm, which the uh, p-value was uh, less than 0 .0, uh, 0 0.0001, which was uh, actually very significant. And uh, the CPV time was very less. Uh, it is, uh, even though uh, we are doing, uh, we can do it as a concomitant surgery, actually it doesn't increase the significant uh, CPV time or cross-clamp time. And the post-operative time is uh, not so much. The mean was seven, and the bleeding post-operative bleeding was uh, around 250 ml. The mean was 240. Uh, and uh, at the POD 15, you can see that the rate of uh, the freedom from AF was in 81 percent of the patients. And at the uh, one month, it was 94 percent, and at three months, it was 100 percent. And if there was sustained sinus rhythm in six months, uh, it was 100 percent. So actually, we had a small cohort. That is the main limitation of it. We had only 16 number of cases. So the conclusion is that the pulmonary vein isolation alone may be an adequate treatment for patients with paroxysmal AF undergoing mitral valve surgery. And cut and sew technique has several advantages when compared to the radio frequency ablation. In, uh, uh, in most of the studies, they have proved that radio frequency ablation can uh, uh, revert the patients back into sinus rhythm. But the thing is that uh, uh, after once the edema and the, uh, this um, uh, inflammation goes, weans off, uh, then there are chances that the PV reconnect back because they are not permanent lesions. They are non-permanent lesions. But whereas in cut and sew technique, they are permanent uh, uh, lesions, which are a foolproof discontinuation for the perpetuation of the AF waves. So, so this is uh, more advantageous and there is no extra cost. And the, the, there is an advantage of the uh, surgeon having direct vision and we can uh, directly see the pulmonary veins while we do the surgery. And uh, there are less chances of pulmonary vein stenosis and complications uh, post-RFA as we can see. And uh, we have better hemodynamics post-operatively and uh, we have less valve-related complications and less thromboembolic. They have studied on uh, post-operative patients that uh, in PE, they have one study where they have shown that even though patient is on anticoagulation, there are 1.6% of patients who are having uh, recurrent thromboembolic strokes, even though the patients are on anticoagulation. So exclusion of uh, LA appendage is advantageous. So this is uh, most reproducible and uh, less learning curve. We can give advantages to the patients. The limitations were the small cohort and the follow-up period was uh, less uh, due to the COVID limitations. We could not do uh, too many cases. Any questions, sir? Nothing.
the next topic for the free paper presentation is a retrospective study, a novel technique for RSOV, VSDS surgical correction, our 15 years experience by Dr. Chirag Sumitra Prasanna Kumar. Good morning, one and all. I am Dr. Chirak from Jaidev Institute of Medical Sciences, Bangalore. My topic is a long-term outcome of uh, surgery for RSOV VHD subsets using a novel technique. In this uh, paper, I will be mainly concentrating on the technique, what we have followed. The aims and objectives is to evaluate the safety, efficacy, and long-term integrity of the novel repair technique used for the RSOV VHD subset. A surgical correction using a double patch technique in a standard is a standard operation discussed for the RSOV VHD. The embryological basis being the separation between the aortic media and supporting ventricular fibrous structure, as described by Jesse Edward. The direct closure of VHD and placation of dilated sinus of Valsalva was described by Magdi Yakub for the VHD AS complex. We have used the technique of VHD closure direct closure of VHD and a patch closure of sinus valsalva defect in our last 15 years. This is the anatomy uh, to show the other. So we, we have taken the subset of uh, mainly Sakaki Gabara Sakaki Bara 1 and 2 with the VHD subset. Our surgical technique being a standard midline sternotomy with a bicable iota bicable cannulation, RSP venting and uh, fibrillatory arrest and direct ostial plesia following the oblique aerotomy and topical cooling for the myocardial protection. And we cool the patient to 28 degrees. So our technique includes, uh, we usually follow the bicameral approach that is trans aortic and trans pulmonary to assess the anatomy of VST, aortic valve leaflet and RSOV. Following oblique aerotomy, the, uh, through the transpulmonary approach, we will amputate the, the redundant uh, sinus of valsalva aneurysmal tissue. And uh, through the oblique aerotomy, the, uh, the VHD has been seen. So, so the left end most is the anterior view where below the leaflet we can see the VHD. So the uh, interrupted plagiated sutures, that is uh, two of polyester sutures, uh, plagiated sutures are taken to the RV side, and the, those sutures are passed to the annulus of the leaflet. And uh, then we take a prosthetic background patch, which is been planned little redundant to match the physiological sinus curvature. And this patch is, this patch is closed with the two, uh, two polyester plagiated sutures to close the sinus defect. And the sutures which are used for the direct closure of VHT is being passed to the same Dacron patch, which is used as a reinforcement and tied down. These are the interoperative images. In the first image, you can see the plagiates which are taken in the RV side, that is the VHD. And uh, the second image is the trans PA approach. Uh, through the forceps, we are holding the amputate part of the RSOV, and we can see the plagiates in the RV side. And third, third one is the post correction, where we can see the patch which has been placed uh, as a closure of sinus defect. And all the three leaflets are co-opting well. Uh, all the three aortic leaflets are co-opting well. So we use TE for all our cases to assess the uh, AR, any residual RSOV or VSD. If there is any AR more than mild, we would like to address it either with the aortic valve repair, usually trustless, and uh, our replacement which, uh, in which the leaflets are not amenable for the repair. And if there is any residual VSD, we take additional sutures. And if there is any residual RSOV, we address through the PA by closing the defect with in two layers. 
but in our uh, case study, we have not uh, come across any residual RSOVs. So this is one of our T image of uh, case. Uh, the first uh, picture shows the RSOV VST subset, uh, Sakakai one and and uh, in the second, we uh, can see after a direct closure and a patch closure, there is no residual listing, either the AR or the VST or any RSO. So our study included a time period of uh, January 2006 to uh, December 2020. It, uh, it was total 67 patients uh, with RSO VST with or without AR. And it's, uh, the details are taken from the unit database of a single surgeon. From our hospital. It's a retrospective analysis by retrieving the relevant uh, preoperative and intraoperative clinical data uh, to show the safety of our technique. And we have followed it up. Recently, we called them to the, by the phone and we could contact only 45 cases. So there are total 12 dropouts. And all these patients were called to OPD uh, for the clinical assessment, 2 day echo, and ECG. So results are like this. Uh, uh, we have operated an age group of around 15 to 43, 15 years to 43. The one, one patient required a hyaluronic valve replacement. He had a vegetation in the hyaluronic leaflet. Uh, otherwise, we have one, one mortality that is because of a CVA. And the total three patients required hyaluronic valve repair, that is by uh, Sussler's repair. And two patients had residual VSD, which was picked up. Uh, intraoperatively uh, after the coming of CPB, which was addressed immediately. So our average ICU stay is two to four days mm -hmm. and uh, post-op overall stay is like seven to 10 days. So among them, we had uh, two female mm -hmm. patients who actually had an uneven pregnancy. So none of our mm -hmm. patients required any reoperation. So in our preoperative follow-up, all the patients have mild to trivial AR. None of them have any residual VSD or RSOV with, a, with adequate biological function. So in RSOV, in a Sakaki Bala type one and two with, a, with VSD, the septal defect is right under the right coronary cusp and the VSD associated are like slit-like, which is easily amenable for the direct closure. Uh, the, the Yakub described this direct closure for the VSD as subset. And also, he added a plication for the dilated sinus, which is difficulty in, which is little difficult in other survey cases. And the article by Sang Ho Jung uh, showed there is a high incidence of air whenever a transaortic direct closure was used for other survey. Article by Thomas uh, had shown the 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 SOV aneurysms can be managed with the large SOV aneurysms can be managed with the patch closure. To the transaortic approach. So our technique incorporates the principles of Yakub of direct closure to the transaortic uh, transaortic approach with uh, using a, a prosthetic patch for the reinforcement of the SOV defect, and trans it also we use transpulmonary excision of SOV aneurysm sac. We believe our approach addresses all the embryological and anatomical aspect of RSOV VST with or without AR. Uh, and our post-operative outcomes are comparable, comparable with uh, Thomas Saka's long-term results, which included 129 cases in terms of safety and efficacy. So conclusion being the technique of our direct closure of VHT originally described by Yaku for VHT AR is more suitable for RSOV VHT and a trans and transaortic prosthetic patch closure of RSOV provides the long-term results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pilar. Hello. The next presenter is Dr. Surendra Patel. He'll be speaking on the topic uh, use of roller pump in uh, venovenous ECMO as an emergency rescue procedure. So 
Good morning to all. Myself, Dr. Surendra Patel, Associate Professor in Department of CTVS at AIMS Jodhpur, presenting one of our catastrophic complications of ECMO, uh, in which our pump failed uh, after initiation of three hours. And uh, we are presenting how we manage that situation. I am nothing to disclose. As we all know, the use of ECMO has increased in the recent COVID era, especially in the intensive care units. And ECMO machine malfunction is a very catastrophic situation, especially in peripheral centers and in over overburdened ICU due to lack of the uh, immediate replacement machine and service engineer. AM Jodhpur is situated in the Western Rajasthan, which is around 360 kilometers from Jaipur and 650 kilometers away from New Delhi. And our journal level service engineer usually available at New Delhi. And we have only one ECMO machine available with us and none was available in vicinity. And we are reporting successful use of roller pump with conventional CPP circuit as the emergency stop gap rescue VV ECMO. Our patient was 41 year old male patient suffering from ARDS and we initiated VV ECMO in that patient. After three hours of initiation, our ECMO pump malfunctioned. We immediately put a patient on hand crank for uh, management. And after consultation with service engineer on telephone, we found that our flows measuring and power supply board in the console was malfunctioned and that cannot be repaired immediately. And it will it require major repair or replacement of the machine. This was the error in our console. And we use an emergency hand crank for at least five hours. The video showing that. We, during that time, we kept uh, calling to multiple perfumists, multiple our surgical team members and uh, uh, company persons who are of Meke to how to uh, tackle this error. And during that period, we were able to maintain adequate flows on hand crank and we were expecting 12 to 24 hours more for repair or replacement of machine. And it was impractical to continue on hand crank for the prolonged periods. After thorough discussion with our team, we, are, we have decided to use roller pump with conventional CPB circuit with reservoir. And for that, we hypnotize the patient to maintain a CT of more, more than 40 seconds. We prime the reservoir with crystalloid solution. We put a patient on maximum ventilated support and we clamped the <coughs> drainage and attend cannula and uh, ECMO circuit disconnected from the cannula and we connect this uh, conventional CPB tubing after de airing and we put a patient on VV ECMO on roller pump after five hours of malfunction. And this is our circuit that consists of the femoral venous drainage calendar draining into, into the reservoir with adequate priming volume as a safety measure through roller pump via accelerator return cannula in the right IJV. And we were able to maintain flow rate of four liters per minute with a target saturation of 85%. Our journal head service team from Delhi arrived 11 hours after malfunction by road and he put a new motherboard in a malfunctioned machine, which also became malfunctioned. And at that time we were in deep trouble as we have no further backup. And it was already 11 hours on roller pump VV ECMO. Then after contacting multiple centers, we finally found another machine from Jaipur, uh, <coughs> which came around 20, uh, 21 hours after the malfunction. And uh, when that machine arrived, we again put a patient on maximum ventilated support. We clamped the cannulas and we again initiated VV ECMO on centrifugal pump. And total duration of CPB with, conventional CPB with roller pump was 15 hours and 20 minutes. And during this period, we were able to maintain adequate flows with target saturation of more than 85% without any complications like bleeding, hemolysis, or embolism. And we used previously used ECMO tubing. Uh, we previously used ECMO tubing kept circulating in the roller pump slowly at a speed of 100 ml per minute to prevent damage. And the same circuit we used again when the replacement machine arrived. This is the video showing how we used uh, both uh, roller pump in VV ECMO and simultaneously we, are, we kept circulating the previously used uh, centrifugal tubing uh, slowly at a rate of 100 ml per minute to prevent damage of that tubing also. So we are circulating both the tubings. Uh, as we all know, centrifugal pumps are now a standard of care for ECMO circuits worldwide. Our concept to use roller pump is, be, uh, is based on the fact that in pediatric or neonatal uh, ECMO, we, uh, neonatal VA ECMO, 
some centers are using roller pump a study conducted by also in 2011 regarding use of neonatal va ecmo suggests that 53% centers use routinely roller pump for the neonatal va ecmo and only 15% use centrifugal pump but in comparison to 2002 the use of centrifugal pump for neonatal va ecmo increases eight fold from five center to 39 centers and on literature such we have not found any literature regarding use of roller pump in vb ecmo that's why we have presented this and the challenges we faced were first were negative pressure and, and suction due to the increased negative pressure and suction the right atrial valve may suck and uh, hamper the venous return for that we kept a reservoir in the circulation circuit and we intermittent partially clamped the venous line second were mechanical shear force on tubing that may cause damage, damage to tubing or cause in, increased hemolysis p et al also concluded that tubing rupture occurred after an on an average of 7 to 244 hours in roller pump and our total duration on roller pump was 15 hour 20 minutes without any evidence of damage to tubing or hemolysis and as we all know in roller pump we have to increase the dose of heparin to maintain acidity of more than 480 instead of acidity of 180 to 200 in centrifugal pump we maintained acidity of more than 40 seconds without any evidence of bleeding large size of pump can hamper the mobility of patient and last uh, challenge was overheating of roller pump and pump failure on prolonged use mirko cluza et al concluded that the circuit heating and substantial limitation in flow detection should be taken into account if clinical use in situation of crisis is considered after this initial complication we have able to successfully wean our, our patient from vv ecmo on 43rd day uh, now conclusion <clears throat> this technique can be life saving in catastrophic situation such as ecmo machine malfunction especially at peripheral centers which lack backup machines or there is no on site service engineer available for immediate repair these are our references and this is a image with the patient with our team at the time of discharge of patient thank you all any questions from audience Our next presenter is Dr. D. P. Agarwal. He'll be presenting on our experience with modified LOSR clap (MEP) in cases of post-pulmonary surgery, bronchopleural fistula. With I'll be presenting today our experience with modified laser clap. In cases of post pulmonary surgery, that is, and bronchopulmonary fistula. So, a bronchopulmonary fistula is defined as a communication between a main bronchus or a lobe of the and pleural space after numeric coming or lobe coming. With an incident reported in literature, which varies from 0.3% to 20%, it takes takes into account numeric coming as well as lobe coming. Despite the recent advances in medicine, bronchopulmonary fistula remains a debilitating disease process with considerable morbidity and mortality. Most common cause of PPF is infection. Other causes can be post pneumonic coming, poor surgical technique, long bronchial stem, devascularization of the bronchus, previous irradiations, malnutrition, concomitant infections, pulmonary fatigue, lung abscess, pneumonia. The period of hospitalization is often long, and multiple or is long, and often multiple operative procedures are necessary for the bronchopulmonary fistula. Sometimes patients are in chronic debilitated state with high risk for 
the general anesthesia as well as thoracoplastic procedures. So we took, this is our retrospective study, which was performed on the uh, eight, eight consecutive patients who underwent the uh, modified adhesive flap procedure in KM Hospital Mumbai from 2017 to 2020. Mean age of the patients were 28 years plus or minus 10, with six of them were male and two of them were female. Out of the eight patients, five, were, uh, five patients had history of pulmonary tuberculosis and three patients had history of fungal infection. Out of the total eight patients, three patients underwent lower low globectomy, four patients underwent upper low globectomy, and one patient underwent pneumonectomy. During this procedure of study, a hospital underwent 75 total of pulmonary resection. Thus, the incidence of post resection tested at our place was 10.6%. Previously, all the patients underwent conventional chest X-ray, standard laboratory evaluations that are normally done, pulmonary function testing, chest, CT, and fiber optic bronchoscopy scanning were performed with most of all the patients that came for the procedure. All the patients in this series received various therapeutic information, uh, intervention before the MEF was planned. Common therapeutic modalities that were used were including bronchoscopic occlusion using the plug, glue, or, glue, or even tube thoracoscopy for a longer time. Patients, patient staff were retrospectively reviewed as per the age, sex, presenting symptom, past medical histories, past thoracic surgical history, history of ethanol or tobacco uses, tuberculosis, fungal infection, nutritional status, preoperatively CXR, white blood cell count, which was during the admission during the course and as well as discharge, operative indications, operative techniques in hospital outcomes including length of stay, days on ventilator, morbidity and mortality associated. Long-term follow-up was attained at the mean follow-up year of one year. All patients underwent modified allergia procedure as per the symbols and associated techniques. In brief, I'll discuss this technique. That is, the patient is placed in a decubital, later decubital's position depending on the size involved with involving chest up. An incision is made so as to create an inverted U-shaped flap of the skin and subcutaneous tissue over the empyema cavity. Base of the flap is 2 to 3 centimeter, 2 to 4 inches wide and lies over the most dependent part of the cavity so that it can breathe. Its length is about 2 to 3 inches or equal to the width of 2 or more ribs and their intercostal spaces. Portion of 2 or 3 of the ribs beneath the U-shaped incision are dissected subperiostally and cut, removed. The soft tissue portion of the chest wall overlying the abscess cavity is then resected, completely overlooking the empyema cavity. After achieving hemostasis and optimal air seal of the surrounding lung tissue, U-shaped skin flap is reflected onto the most dependent position of the abscess cavity and sutured to the cavity's floor. Edges of skin are then marsupialized onto the surrounding soft tissue and a sterile dressing is applied, as we can see in the figure. We can see this is the immediately post OT. That is, in a, a photo is taken where we marsupialize the skin, and we can see that proper air seal and cavity is a dependent cavity. Post operatively, care of the cavity includes once a day dressing, packing with wet to dry gloves for approximately one month, and then the cavity starts sealing with granulation tissue. And thereafter, the cavity is generally irrigated once daily, unless a bronchopleural fistula is present. In which cases, continuous packing with the wet to dry gauze is performed secondary to the continuity package. And once healthy granulated tissue is formed, we just pack cavity once in a three days and then simple dressing is done. We can see this after one month the procedure, the bronchopleural fistula is meant there is granulation tissue developing from inside. The surrounding area, we had to debride this one because of the whitish tissue, as we can see that it had some infected cavity. And this is after three months, you can see that it has healed almost 60 to 70%. We have seen in most of the cases that by six months, most of our patients, only a three to four centimeter gap was present, otherwise it was very nicely. Results. The most common symptoms of patient under the, uh, this flap was dyspnea, fever, tube drainage, more than 200 ml per day, weight loss, lethargy, chronic productive cough, chest pain, or rarely, Hemoptysis. The presenting white blood cell sound for all the patients when that we took were mostly 18,000 plus or minus 5, whereas the, uh, whereas the discharging white blood cell counts was 8,000 plus or minus 4. The most common organism that we found to be operating in the pleural fluid or intraoperative empyema tissue culture that was 
was the gram positive uh, organisms like step and strep. We can see it in the next slide as the table is formed. We can see that it was Staphylococcus, it was two patients, Streptococcus, four patients, Klebsiella, five, Shiromonas, four, and we can see Hemophilus, Acinetal vector in two patients. The most common preoperative intervention was, uh, was antibiotic therapy. That is, we give antibiotic therapy as per culture and sensitivity to all the patients. We placed two thoracostom in all the patients for empyma. The bronchoscopic glue was done in two patients, and bronchoscopic plug was done in two patients. But in spite of that, the results were not good. Intraoperative and in hospital outcomes will be seen in table two. That is, the number of ribs resected for the modified LOCS but at least two ribs were resected in almost all the patients. Total length of stay was 28 days in the ICU, that is approximately one month. Total cost of hospital stay was 100 days, that is almost three months. And once the it was healed properly, we used to send patient home and just call for dressing. And total length of overall stay, as we can see, is 152 day plus or minus nine. Discussion. Bronchopleural fistula is a serious, sometimes fatal disorder, which is usually follows pulmonary dissection, but at times occurs spontaneously. It is a most commonly associated with tuberculosis, especially in India. It's a tuberculosis that is most common. Out of the eight patients, we saw many had tuberculosis preoperatively. In association with pulmonary resection for other inflammatory disorders and spontaneously in patients with necrotizing pneumonia, lung abscess, and empyema. Unfortunately, formation of a bronchopleural fistula usually results in long term morbid course affecting the patient physically as well as psychologically. Floyd and Sinist reported a 28% incidence of fistula formation among 32 pneumonectomies and overall 10.5 for 430 resection carried out in tuberculosis during early antibiotic era. As we can see, but due to all these anti tubercular drugs and early treatment, the rate of fistula formation has decreased considerably. Also, the number of patients undergoing resection for tuberculosis is 24 times less than that was before. Technically, factors surely plays a role, but local preferences for various types of suture material and use of pleural fluid seems to uh, flaps seems to be of little consequences. Bronchopillar fistula occurs with all type of bronchial closures, including stapling or even with intervascular flap or pleural flaps sometimes. Post surgery, fistula may present early with culminating cores characterized by sepsis, empyma, pulmonary sputum, and respiratory insufficiency. Massive air leak, gross disruption of bronchus require immediate exploration and revision of the bronchial closure. Initial therapies of often open drainage dependent drainage. If a bronchial bronchopleural fistula is present, the fistula should be closed with either myoplasty or omentoplasty followed by a single stage muscle flap closure of remaining spaces. Many small fistulas will heal when drainage is established. When in cases in which there is active tuberculosis and in other incidences wherein fistula doesn't close even with the open drainage and when patient has chronic debilitating uh, features like malnutrition, weight loss, continuous fever, unable to tolerate general anesthesia and with low lung volume and capacity, modified allosial flap seems to be a very reasonable approach even though it is a mutilating surgery. Allosial flap is considered as a permanent one-stage procedure and is specifically used for those debilitating patients that could not be a candidate for muscle flap. So our conclusion is in the, from this current study is that we have confirmed that in a selected group of patients, a modified allosial flap is a safe, effective surgical technique for treatment of advanced empyma with bronchopleural fistula. The modified allosial procedure remains as an important option in the armadarium for thoracic surgeons participating in surgical treatment of chronic complicated bronchopleural fistula, especially for the patient with low volume and capacity and not for are not accepting general anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the last presentation uh, for today's session is by Dr. Kiran Gopal. He'll be presenting on uh, short and midterm outcomes of isolated outcome CABT. Good morning. I thank the association for this privilege. This uh, paper is from the Amta Institute of Medical Sciences in Puchi, Canada. Excellent. So, uh, in other thoracic surgery, we all know that cabbage is our bread and butter procedure. I mean, what happens usually is when we do this procedure day in and day out, we often 
focus, lose focus, we only focus on the individual patient that we see day to day and we forget to stand back and look at our outcomes. So I felt it was appropriate to look at our outcomes in uh, off-pump carriage and see what factors are associated with midterm outcomes. Next slide. So coming to the background, Amta Hospital is located in uh, central Kerala and it, uh, it's a 1200 bed tertiary referral hospital, uh, which has a drainage area of four adjacent districts and from the neighboring Tamil Nadu. Next, please. So uh, the adult cardiac surgery department is, uh, functions as three divisions, adult cardiac, pediatric cardiac, and thoracic. Around 1,200 cases a year. And, and in adult cardiac surgery, there are currently four surgeons who have done the majority of the cases of, involved in this surgery. And as we, again, in adult cardiac, uh, in all cardiac surgery, it's generally a high risk. There are risks involved. So, and we have what we know for all and any risky procedure, it experience matters. So, for this particular study, the younger surgeon involved in the study had three at least three years post MCH experience. Next slide. Coming to the objectives, the primary objective was to study the survival outcomes of isolated OPCAB, and the secondary objective was to look at uh, factors associated with both short and midterm survival. So there were, we took there was we took all consecutive 1,808 patients who underwent isolated OPCAB from November 2014 to December 2019. So a five-year period. This is a retrospective observational study, and the association of relevant variables was studied in relation to both 30-day and midterm mortality. So there was a total of 1,808 patients, of which the 30-day mortality was 42 patients. We lost 178 patients to follow up and the midterm mortality was 100 patients. So we had a surviving cohort of uh, 1,488 patients. Next slide. These were the factors analyzed, both pre-operative and post-operative. Next. Statistical analysis was in a standard fashion and we looked at by multi, uh, multivariate logistic regression, we analyzed the midterm factors associated with midterm outcomes. Uh, survival pro probability was assessed by Kaplan-Meier curves. Our findings in, in brief, the operative or 30-day mortality was 2.3% and midterm mortality was 6.3%, which led to an overall mortality of 8.6%. Uh, on univariate analysis, this is just uh, first for 30-day mortality. These, when analyzing the pre-operative variables, the factors which were found significant were age greater than 62 years, Emergency surgery, a high Euroscore of more than six, uh, the presence, presence of peripheral vascular disease, and the presence of dialysis dependent renal failure. So these are the pre op variables associated with 30 day mortality. Uh, and also, I forgot severe left ventricular dysfunction also. For the post operative variables associated with 30 day mortality, uh, re exploration was uh, renal failure, stroke. Presence of post op, the occurrence of post operative atrial fibrillation and uh, occurrence of mediastinitis were associated with uh, increased 30 day mortality. Coming to midterm outcomes, the pre operative uh, factors were age greater than 62 years. Sorry. Uh, presence of COBT, peripheral vascular disease, dialysis dependent renal failure, uh, the present post operative pre operative stroke the use of the IMA and the presence of moderate or severe LV dysfunction. Coming to post-operative variables associated with midterm mortality, fact, all these factors are found significant. That is uh, prolonged ICU stay, use of inotrope, use high, prolonged ventilation hours, re-exploration, renal failure, stroke, and IABP. Uh, oh, uh, so, what we did, so I couldn't, uh, I didn't, instead of this, due to the lack of time, I thought I'd just show the, our three in factors which I found interesting, which affected out midterm outcomes. One is dialysis dependent renal failure, one is occurrence of re expiration, and the third is post operative atrial fibrillation. These are all pretty common what we see. So, what were our, our experience of association of dialysis dependent renal failure with 30 day mortality? You can see a significant mortality if the patient has dialysis dependent renal failure preoperatively. 
And this is this also translates to the midterm outcomes. Also, you can see that the uh, incidence of uh, uh, mortality is high at sixty percent at midterm follow up. Looking into the literature, also we find similar data in the literature. This is just one paper which I pulled up, and it, in that also, it, the thirty day, the short term mortality was at eight point four percent, and this was not different between both on and off pumped cabbages. Coming for re-exploration, another thing that in our study it was the incidence of re-exploration was around two point four percent, but this again showed a significant association with both thirty day mortality and at midterm mortality. Which were both significant with significant p values. Again, looking into the literature, uh, yeah, again so more or less similar outcomes. With a, there's a 4.5 fold higher incidence of operative mortality just for taking a patient back for re-expiration for bleeding. Coming to the la last factor, another common thing that we see post-operative atrial fibrillation. Our associate, we again the incidence in our population was around 16 percent. So the but if the patient did develop post op AF, the incidence of mortality at the short term was eight percent, and at mid term was again nineteen percent. So again, significantly higher. Coming to the literature review again, a similar finding is seen in the literature. One year follow up, I, I, there's an increased mortality of an odds ratio of one point nine four. We are also presented our data in the Indian Journal last couple of years ago, showing that almost similar finding. We had an incidence of 16% with a three-year survival down to 84% compared to 95% if it, the patient remained in normal sinus rhythm. Again, I'll just skip this slide. So since all these factors came as positive, when we did a multivariate analysis of midterm mortality, the factors which are associated with uh, Survival was the post-op presence of post-op renal failure, use of the IABP, mediastinitis, severe LV dysfunction, COPD, and age greater than 62 years. Coming to the kaplan meier survival curves, our uh, me median overall survival in number of days was 2,176, and the five-year survival was 89%. We look at the event-free survival again, the means uh, survival was at 1,837 days, and the five year uh, event free survival was 73%. Take home messages so, off pump CABG does provide good short and mid term outcomes in our population. Multivariate factors associated with that were age greater than 62, 62 years, the presence of post op renal failure, use of IABP, severe LV dysfunction, mediastinitis high Euroscore and uh, presence of COPD. Multi-center data from India and outcomes and off-pump CVG and factors associated with it will be needed to be produced to provide more robust data for this most commonly done cardiac surgical procedure in our population. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bridge for moderating the session. Please note uh, there are IACTS elections going on in Hall A. And uh, the voting time is from 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Uh, you can also vote online. I thank all the presenters, uh, delegates, and guests in the audience for sparing their valuable time. We'll be starting session two in another five minutes. Thank you. Uh, we'll be starting session two now of free paper presentation. Uh, the moderators of the session are Dr. Bridge Mohan, Dr. Prateep Pokarna, Dr. Avi Kumar. I request the moderators to join me on stage. The first presentation of session two is by Dr. Jivesh John Thomas. Uh, Dr. Pankaj Gupta. Uh, the topic of his presentation is long-term outcomes following aortic root replacement with Medtronic Freestyle Wire. Good afternoon, Chor. Greetings from Lissi Hospital, Kuchin. I will be presenting the long term outcomes following aortic root replacement with the Metronic Freestyle Valve. So, as an introduction, the ideal substitute uh, for the aortic root replacement has, uh, is still undetermined. A composite mechanical valve is the most commonly used one all over the world uh, in patients who require a combined aortic valve root as well as the ascending aorta replacement. But as you all know, it's limited, especially in the elderly population, because of the need for long term anticoagulation. So the other option was an aortic homograft, which had good long-term results uh, initially, and particularly if it was implanted as a freestanding aortic root. 
the lower transvalvular gradients associated with it uh, gave better left ventricular mass regression and it, it was uh, it showed good resistance to infection as well as other valve related complications however the late degeneration which is marked by heavy calcification and valve dysfunction as well as the limited availability of homographs have uh, is a, a major um, dis uh, disadvantage of homographs and this has stimulated the research for other substitutes with a similar hemodynamic profile and uh, equal or even better durability so this is the freestyle valve uh, metro, uh, produced by metronic yeah it, uh, it was used as uh, it can be used as a full root technique as a uh, modified bendel or it can be used just to replace the valve as a complete subcoronary technique or uh, in some cases in selected cases we can use it as a modified subcoronary technique the present study was undertaken to evaluate the the clinical the hemodynamic morphological results of a composite i mean the metronic freestyle valve with or without a dacron graft extension for the replacement of aortic valve root and the ascending aorta so uh, cases in which it was used as a modified or a, a totally subcoronary technique was were excluded between 2008 and 2014 we had uh, around 22 patients and now it has touched around 44 uh, but we included only these 22 patients so as to find out the long term outcome the average age was 55 plus or minus 13 years they underwent a total root replacement the patients were followed up for a mean period of 11 years and uh, the the first case which was done in 2008 has now touched 14 years they were followed up directly or via telephonic interview and um, evolving aortic valve dysfunction was defined as an aortic regurgitation more uh, around uh, more than mild that is uh, moderate ish as well as a mean gradient of more than 15 so coming to our results and 16 of them were alive at uh, long term follow up 82% of may were males and 18 percentage were females three of them were uh, jehovah witness patients in whom uh, we cannot give blood or blood products four of our patients had an aortic dissection so it is all emergency cases four of them had an aneurysm of the ascending aorta two patients had an infective endocarditis uh, with damage to the aortic root and which needed aortic root uh, development of an aortic root abscess which needed a, a root replacement and three of our patients had marfan so these were the the indication for the patients um these were the the freestyle valves the sizes that were used majority of them were 23 concomitant surgeries uh, performed included cabg asd closure mitral valve replacement and including a redo mitral valve replacement a redo uh, mvr plus uh, freestyle implantation the median cross clamp and cardiopulmonary bypass times were not uh, too long coming to the hemodynamic performance in the immediate post op period the uh, the p gradients were quite low around 16 and uh, the maximum that we got was around 21 which at 5 years these are the p gradients man and these are the mean gradients the the highest mean gradient that we got was around 10.3 at 5 uh, years coming to the distribution of mean gradients so in around 60 to 70% of people the the mean gradient remained at less than 10 and at around 5 to 7 years we can see a, a slight rise in the mean gradients but then again at uh, around 9 years the mean gradients are not too high coming to the post operative complications that we came across the total mortality was uh, around 6 the immediate post op mortality was 1 uh, it was a patient with an aortic dissection uh, he developed uh, renal failure and uh, he also presented with a, a stroke you know like which evolved and we couldn't save him at 3 months there was one mortality it was a, a case of uh, infective endocarditis infective endocarditis of the the um, of the root of the freestyle valve and he was a jehovah witness patient we wanted uh, we advised a redo surgery for him but then it was you know uh, too risky to not give blood and blood products they opted for a medical management and we couldn't save him medically 
Then at three years, there were two mortalities. One was uh, unrelated, just a, a thyroid malignancy, and the other patient had a, a, a CVA. At five years, again, we had two mortalities, uh, which was again, uh, one was a, an unrelated malignancy, and the other one was an aortic dissection uh, involving the arch with a CVA. And um, he was referred to, uh, to another hospital because of economic constraints, and uh, you know, uh, he had a postoperative mortality there. So again, uh, the infective endocarditis, one patient at uh, three months and one at three years. CVA, uh, one at three years. We didn't have to do any, any redos on these patients. And aortic regurgitation was almost nil. So coming to the conclusion, the composite freestyle valve is a reasonable alternative for patients who require a combined aortic valve root and ascending aorta replacement, especially in patients in whom uh, anticoagulation is uh, contraindicated. It is also it, it shows excellent hemodynamic performance in our long-term follow-up. However, we need studies with a, a larger sample size and a longer follow-up period uh, before we can uh, declare, you know, as it's a gold standard. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jivesh. Any question? What is the uh, rate of bentals in your uh, this one with the mechanical prostate? Um, Suppose you get a 10 cases of requiring aortic root replacement. How many go for a mechanical one? How many go for a biological one? So, um, you know, like uh, our incidence of putting in a mechanical valve is actually very less. And even uh, for our valve patients, most of them, um, you know, once we talk to them, they agree for it. A tissue valve rather than a mechanical valve. So basically, uh, patients more than 40 or 45 years, we talk to them regarding you know the advantages of putting in a mechanical valve to avoid a re-surgery. Uh, but then maybe it's because of our communication or maybe because of their understanding. I, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, we tend to put a more of tissue valves. But however, uh, I mean, like we were apprehensive that we may have to have a redo for them. But then um, since when we analyze our results, like from 2008, we haven't had to, uh, uh, we didn't have to do a redo on them till now, like 14 years, they are doing well. Why not a biobental versus uh, um, Like maybe um, our center, we are not very tuned to doing a biobental, uh, we might, and uh, when we can, like from our results, when we can achieve a good result with the freestyle, we didn't, you know, think about needing a biobender. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the house? Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. One patient, your one patient having a uh, arc vessel dissection, you were saying. Uh, this is identified at that uh, interop inter period? No, this was five years after the five, year after, after. five years after. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Javesh. Our next presenter is Dr. Kaushik R. He'll be presenting on modified Ozaki procedure, a five-year follow-up period. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm here to present a topic on modified Ozaki, a five-year follow-up. A basic introduction on why this topic has been done. Uh, aortic valve is one of the second most is the second most commonest valve to be involved in valvular heart disease, which either warrants a replacement or a repair based upon the pathology. Uh, aortic valve replacement has its own uh, setbacks like patient prosthesis mismatch, and second is the ma the major drawback is uh, thromboembolic phenomenon. This puts us to the biggest question. What is a Wasaki procedure? Basically, we use autologous glutaraldehyde treated pericardium, which is harvested on table from the patient. And it is uh, being treated with 0.05% glutaraldehyde for a pay, for a thank you a time of eight minutes. And from the treated glutaraldehyde pericardium, we uh, refashion the aortic valves, valve leaflet, aortic neocuspidization, neocuspidization is basically done. And uh, with this background, we'll go to the topic. Uh, 
next slide this is a single center study done by a single surgeon over a follow up period of 7 years from march 2016 to march 2022 uh, we have total on follow up about 138 patients with the basic inclusion criteria of patients presenting with mixed aortic valve lesions and other concomitant valves and ischemic heart disease in whom the aortic valve is not amenable to repair patients in whom the valve is amenable to repair and those who are not willing for procedure were excluded from the study uh, we had used uh, microsoft excel and spss for the statistical analysis the statistical analysis was basically made into pre operative intra operative peri operative and post procedural post procedurally we had called up patients at 1 month 3 1 month 3 months 6 months 1 year 3 year and Five years. The data that is depicted here is based upon the last follow-up of the patient. Coming to the pre-operative data, the demographics, the median age of the patients is around 19 years, and the median follow-up period was 28 months, with a three is to one male is to female uh, ratio, and uh, it was more commonly noted among a younger cohort. Patients were most commonly among uh, around less than 20 years of age. The a uh, surgical procedure mainly involved isolated osaki patients undergoing only aortic valve neocuspidization and those with uh, concomitant procedure the the data of the concomitant procedure is been displayed there in our study we found out that around 56% of the people underwent a concomitant procedure the perioperative uh, the intraoperative uh, assessment we mainly Uh, followed two things one was our cross clamp time and second was our cpb time and what the median cpb time was around 185 minutes and median cross clamp time was around 130 minutes and what we had noticed is as our learning curve has come down we are now uh, in the trend the trend of our cross clamp and cpb time has now significantly reduced from 180 to 120 minutes and the immediate perioperative data which we had collected was two things one was the orifice area and second was the mean gradient the orifice area mean was around 2.7 and the mean gradient was around 13 which on further follow up is now in single digits the post procedural follow up these data are based upon the last follow up of the patient we mainly looked into ejection fraction lv volume status lv diameters and fourth thing is their nyha class uh, the wall ejection fraction mean was found to be around 57% and uh, volume status uh, edv was around 70 ml and esv of around uh, 33 and uh, idd di uh, diameters dimensions were around 4.6 and 3 nyha class uh, pre operatively most of our patients belong to class 3 and class 4 who on follow up are now being found to be in class 1 and class 2 our uh, kaplan meier curve for uh, mortality we have a mortality of around 10.4% over the period of 5 years we had lost 14 patients of which 8 were due to uh, masi uh, initially when we were started operating this procedure we had a lot of referral in children who had a concomitant valve disease who had an lv idd of more than 7 plus 7 z score so we had lost a few of those patients in our early status uh, stages following which we stopped operating patients with lv idd more than plus 7 z score and we found a tremendous reduction in our mortality we lost four of our patients due to infective endocarditis and two due to covid and uh, the freedom from reintervention among one uh, the 124 patients uh, who are alive we had three patients who had undergone redo and two of them had to undergo redo wasaki as they were children and uh, one of our patient who was operated at 8 years of age has now undergone a catheter based intervention after 6 years uh, for increased gradient uh, so in our study we found out that uh, it is a technically challenging procedure with good long term durability and uh, the major benefit is loss of uh, is the no need for an anticoagulation all our patients on follow up are being put with uh, single antiplatelet uh, medication 
oral and a few of the interop images of the this the first image on the left depicts our version one of our uh, uh, sizes which were made from polycarbonate cpb boxes which are now uh, being changed to 3d reconstructed uh, sizes these are based upon the intercommissural distance and a few of the interop images this one is a uh, the one on the right depicts the leaflets after it has been sized and excised from the treated pericardium prior to implantation and uh, this is how we do a unicuspid and bicuspid valve a total of 47 bicuspid aortic valves have been addressed once the valve leaflets have been excised the iota as a whole is considered as a circle and the midpoint is been taken to measure the uh, leaflet size and with priority being given to uh, avoiding uh, coronary osteal inclusion and this is a small aortic root which had uh, a patient who had undergone a concomitant manusian procedure with Ozaki procedure. This is an aortic root replacement, ascending aortic root replacement with the Ozaki procedure. This was in case of porcelain iota in which we had to cannulate innominate artery. We had done an uh, endotrectomy of the iota following which we had done a Ozaki procedure. This is uh, one of our redo images. The patient presented with brucella endocarditis and there was erosion of the felt which was used to secure the valve leaflet. So we started, we changed from using felt uh, pledgets to pericardial rolled pledgets. So in our, the, during our period of five years, what we have learned and how we have modified ourselves is, first we avoided taking patients with LVIDD more than plus seven Z score. Second, we started using uh, St. Thomas cardioplegia because uh, now uh, recent uh, studies suggest that even Delnido cardioplegia has to be given for a period of, should be repeated over a period of 30 minutes. And we uniformly cooled all patients to 28 degrees Celsius. And we started using pericardial pledges. So the whole surgery revolves around pericardium and use of pericardial leaflets with pericardial pledges. And how we are different from the Ozaki, uh, primary Ozaki procedure is number uh, two differences mainly. Number one, we have our own indigenous templates. Number two, we use 5-0 proline instead of 4-0 proline, which was used by the uh, Ozaki. And uh, we conclude that it is a, a technical challenging procedure with good long-term durability and uh, it can be used with other concomitant cardiac surgeries also. These were two of our articles which were published from the Institute. One is about uh, the initial phases of our, uh, what we had learned in our initial uh, periods when we started doing Ozaki. And second one was a case report about the redo Ozaki in a brucella endocarditis of a child who had come in contact with an infected calf. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Why did you stop using Delnido? Sir, uh, initial stages when we had uh, myocardial protection was LVIDD was already high for those patients. And uh, that time when we were using Delnido, the minimum period for uh, repeating the cardioplegia was around 90. And our cross clamp time was exceeding that at that time. Mm -hmm. But now they are suggesting that even Delnido for children, if it is used, it has to be repeated at 30 minutes. So we started using regular uh, St. Thomas cardioplegia and repeat it every 20 minutes with RV protection, cold cell and drip for every patient. Uh, it's a seven-year-old follow-up, isn't it? Yes, sir. And two how years... Many, how many are uh, children in this? Sir, uh, around 50% of them are children, sir. Children. Our, our cohort is uh, mostly in favor of patients who are less than 20 years. So and our... what happens to the PPM? the patient prosthetic mismatch as patient grows. Uh, according to original Ozaki article, and, no, in our read also, we have not found any mismatch as of now. Only three of them have undergone reduce, sir. And uh, their uh, gradients are still remaining in the lower space, which can be managed medically with the uh, user as of now. Sir, you mentioned, you showed a slide where you have done a root enlargement plus Ozaki. Yes, sir. What was the necessity for root enlargement if you are doing your Ozaki? We couldn't, even the smallest size of our uh, uh, sizer, we were not able to, three leaflets couldn't be accommodated with that. 
so we had to extend one uh, size early one size we had to increase the what what, what was the this one uh, size after uh, root enlargement uh, we were able to pass an 18 size agar adequately through that uh, any questions from the house then now after seven years this gradient is increased is come with the mean gradient of 50 so we we, we subjected it to a balloon the gradient has come down to 25 so we are he's under follow there is a process the ppm what you're saying it can happen because as they grow the recurrent remains the same thank you Thank you, Dr. Kaushik. Our next presenter is Dr. Bogachev Alexander. He'll be presenting on the topic, the midterm results of new semi-frame pericardial aortic valve implantation, a two-center study. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Um, it's a great privilege for me to be here at this uh, meeting. And uh, I would like to share uh, our results of new design, the valve, uh, uh, semi-frame pericardial aortic valve, uh, it calls Tiara, uh, to center study. And uh, currently we have intermediate uh, results. Of course, there are a lot of uh, discussion between uh, stented valves uh, in aortic position and stentless uh, uh, wealth and uh, we are know uh, a lot of advantages of standard wealth easy implantation uh, very uh, small learning curve for young surgeons very predictable uh, results intraoperatively uh, however there are some disadvantages uh, for example uh, small aortic uh, root uh, sometimes is not feasible for stented uh, wealth and for example implantation small size of uh, stented aortic valve, for example, 21, it's uh, no way to further transcatheter uh, implantation. Uh, however, um, uh, stentless valve, uh, of course, uh, not so easy to implantation, longer cross clamping time and uh, 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 more, more difficult uh, to implantation, more demanding uh, to surgical uh, maneuvers uh, and experience. And uh, uh, we designed and we introduced a new generated uh, xenopericardial semi-frame uh, of wealth uh, because it's a very uh, thin uh, <coughs> nitinol wire as a frame and that's why we called it uh, semi-frame. Um, uh, bovine pericardium, which is uh, manufactured from bovine and treated with uh, uh, diepoxy compounded uh, <coughs> Uh, glitter, uh, glycerol, uh, available size uh, at uh, the market uh, at now uh, from 19 uh, to 25 uh, milli uh, millimeters. And it's completely bovine without any uh, additional uh, synthetic uh, material. Inclusion criteria uh, in our study design was uh, patient scheduled to the conventional uh, aortic wealth uh, replacement uh, and uh, patients' uh, indication to the uh, tissue wealth uh, implantation. We excluded patients uh, younger than 18 years uh, old and uh, uh, other wealth uh, replacement and uh, reduced surgery. Uh, from uh, 2012 uh, to December of 2021, we implanted 66 uh, um, valves, uh, uh, six of them uh, implanted in uh, 2012 before the uh, device was registered uh, in uh, our country. And after then, we have a mid-term follow-up uh, with uh, nice results. Uh, and after the registration from uh, 19 to 21, we implanted uh, uh, 59 uh, devices uh, in uh, two uh, research scientific centers. Um, 
it's a small video how to implant this new design valve um, in most cases now we do through the minimal invasive uh, mini j sternotomy uh, decalcification with ranger uh, sizering and uh, we use uh, three uh, prolen stitches uh, for all uh, with uh, needle uh, 17 and a length uh, minimum uh, 90 centimeters much better to use uh, 120 centimeters and we you in through the um, bottom of the sinuses and uh, through the annulus and uh, most of future uh, we do like a parachute uh, we started from the right nadir after then it's uh, uh, under the left coronary uh, artery left nadir and after the um, uh, implantation of the wealth, we do more uh, two or three stitches uh, uh, at the top of uh, commissures. Sometimes we use mattress stitches like uh, during the David procedure. And we fixed the uh, top of uh, commissures uh, uh, outside using the pledges. Nice uh, cooptation, uh, leaflets like uh, after the Ozaki procedure without any um leak or regurgitation after the uh, procedure during the te echo uh intraoperative uh, data uh, in spite of small number of implantation uh, we received a uh, shorter cross clamping time uh, during the isolated aortic valve implantation uh, in comparison with a stented valve uh, 43 uh, minutes it was mean cross clamping time and uh, a little bit more than 70 minutes during the concomitant uh, procedure uh, like a cabbage or uh, a fee ablation uh, interoperatively we uh, have uh, some contraindication uh, for implantation of course we analyzed it uh, before the uh, implantation using uh, TEE uh, sinusus valsalva and uh, sinotabular uh, sin STJ uh, dilatation more than um, uh, 40 millimeters uh, by, by caspid wealth uh, anatomy of course very isometric by caspid wealth it's uh, like a uh, three caspid and uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, optimal for implantation severe calcification of uh, aortic sinuses uh, 66 patients uh, the mean age uh, uh, 66 and uh, 0.7 um 30 day mortality two patient uh, and both of COVID 19 pneumonia because it was uh, old patients uh, and only one reoperation at the midterm follow-up uh due to non-structural uh wealth uh, dysfunction it was a, a leakage uh, uh in zone of uh, nadir of uh, uh, left coronary uh, cusp and without reimplantation wealth we closed this uh, uh, fistula uh, with uh, uh, nice uh, hemodynamical uh, result. Uh, as for um, hemodynamics, uh, uh, maximum gradient using uh, 29 prosthesis was 20, and uh, using 25 milliliter, millimeters uh, prosthesis, uh, peak gradient was uh, 12. In conclusion, I would like to say that uh, implantation of Undesign semi frame pericardial aortic valve tiara is very reproducible procedure uh, more easier than uh, a real stentless uh, aortic valve uh, and it's possible for many surgeons uh, um, with low 30 day mortality and uh, morbidity uh, rates uh, which we confirmed uh, after the 66 uh, uh, procedure in uh, both uh, centers um, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, uh, nitinol uh, wire frame with, uh, uh, will allow to implant transcatheter uh, aortic valve uh, uh, in the future without a rupture of uh, frame like, uh, like uh, during the implantation valve in valve uh, uh, in stented, in stented uh, valve. And it's also a very nice option for small aortic uh, root uh, because you can implant uh one or two size uh, uh, wealth more than uh, standard wealth thank you for your attention thank you. as there is no synthetic material on your valve so do you uh, give some anticoagulant post-operatively for brief period or not uh anticoagulation therapy 
Yes, of course, uh, because uh, we don't have any proofs and uh, we use uh, anticoagulation like in guidelines for biological prosthesis. Okay. Three months is VK anticoagulation therapy and after then uh, only aspirin. Okay. What's the longest follow-up on this lab? The longest follow-up? Uh, we started in uh, 2012 and the six patient we have uh, up to 10 years follow-up without any dysfunction. But it's only uh, six patients which we implanted before the registration of this device. But of course, mean follow-up, um, not, not so long because most of these patients, most of these uh, wealth were implanted uh, from the 19 to 21. This is for a small aortic root. Uh, this is all for a small aortic root. Uh, and uh, we are four size valve, 21, 23. So this is a normal conventional valve, 21 equal to 20, 21. Uh, pardon, repeat the uh, question. Uh, this is your, your uh, valve for a small aortic root. And uh, uh, this accommodate the larger area, larger valve area. So this is giving the more or uh, area uh, using the 21. Yes, you can use a little bit um, uh, uh, more size of prosthesis because uh, the uh, aortic annulus is not a uh, limitation. We use we use uh, uh, sometimes one uh, or uh, two sizes more using such uh, prosthesis than uh, stented uh, wealth. Uh, we orientated to the bottom part of the sinuses. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Our next presenter is Dr. Suraj Nagre. He'll be presenting on the topic descending thoracic aorta to bifemoral bypass grafting in eight in aortobiliac occlusive disease, single center experience of eight years at Grant Medical College, Mumbai, Maharashtra. Good afternoon, all of you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee members for giving me opportunity to speak my topic here. The standard method for aortoiliac revascularization for occlusive disease is through a transabdominal approach. But when this approach is not feasible, then descending thoracic aorta to bifemoral bypass grafting is a good alternative. The purpose of this study is to evaluate effectiveness and results of descending thoracic aorta as an inflow source for uh, aortoiliac diseases, where the transabdominal approach was considered to be hazardous. Descending thoracic aorta to femoral artery bypass has been used as a remedial operation after aortic or axillofemoral graft failure or a graft infection and other intraabdominal pathologies not amenable to the standard aortofemoral revascularization. It can avoid abdominal approach and has been known as a durable procedure with an excellent long-term patency. The aim of study is to describe clinical symptoms, investigation findings, and surgical treatment of aortoiliac occlusive disease where abdominal approach is not feasible. From May 2013 to January 2022, total 20 patients were treated with this surgery at our institute. Thus, total 40 limbs were revascularized. Demographic data, comorbid factors, per operative findings were noted. Indications for surgery in all of these cases are dextrarenal aortoiliac occlusion. In a post operative period, all the patients were evaluated for appearance of a distal pulsation, primary patency, warmness of foot, symptom relief, wound infection, healing of the ulcer, and complication. CT angiography was done in follow up. Maximum follow up is of five years and minimum follow-up of one month was done after the surgery. This is a clinical data. The age group of patient is around 55 to 70 years of age. All of the patients are male. Indication is same, occlusion of the abdominal aorta just after the origin of the renal arteries. There was associated with diabetes, mellitus, and hypertension in more than 25% of the patient. In around three patients, there was altered renal function test in two of the patients. There was coronary artery disease and around four of the patient has a lung pathology. That is the CT angiogram. You can see in a pre-op, the abdominal artery was completely occluded just after the origin of the renal arteries. And this is a post-op CT angio after the grafting. This patient also has a femoral artery, superficial femoral artery occlusion. So we have done femoropopliteal bypass in this case 
in addition to the descending thoracic aorta to bifemoral. Operative steps, the general anesthesia with a hemodynamic monitoring, double lumen endotracheal intubation to allow deflation of the left lung, but it is not always necessary. The patient was positioned with a right semilateral position with a left hemithorax elevated around 30 to 45 degree and pelvis as flat as possible to expose both of the groin regions. Left posterior thoracotomy was performed through the eight intercostal space and then distal descending thoracic aorta just above the diaphragm was loop. Both the femoral arteries were also exposed through the groin incision. Using blunt finger resection, retroperitoneal tunneling was done between the left hemithorax and left uh, supraingual preperitoneal space. Crossover tunnel between both groin incision was created similarly. After partial clamping of the descending thoracic aorta, after systemic heparization, proximal anastomosis of 14 by 7 mm vortex bifurcated graft was performed end to side with the help of a proline 40 suture. The graft limb was drawn through a tunnel between the rectus abdominal muscles and peritoneum to a short midline incision at the level of umbilicus, and from which each limb of the graft was uh, drawn through a subcutaneous tunnel to each side of the groin and anastomos to the common femoral artery with the help of a proline 6 or 13 mm suture. And the chest tube was placed in the left pleural space and incision was closed in layers. That was the intro finding. You can see the lie of the graft uh, just uh, parallel to the or shape of the along the shape of the diaphragm. The lung can be compressed with the help of the lung retractor. These are the intro uh, or the operative data. The duration of surgery was around uh, 2.5 to 4.5 hours, but as with experience, the duration can be decreased. The blood loss is around 200 ml to 400 ml. In some of the patients, there was a superficial wound infection around three to four patients that was treated conservatively. The graft occlusion was there, uh, which was mainly femoropopliteal graft that was additionally done for the superficial femoral artery. And the amyloctomy is done in such a patient with a good flow postoperatively. So the results are no mortality. Mean duration of surgery is around 2.5 to 5 hours. Major morbidity includes the one graft occlusion that is because of that. Uh, Additional femoropopliteal PTFE graft that was done. None of the patient developed proximal propagation of the aortic thrombus. Ulcers, ulcers showed healing. All the patient has good quality life postoperatively, and postoperative to angiogram showed good revascularization. The conclusion is some author may recommend supraciliac aortic bypass surgery without with a, within retroperitoneal space just for gestational aortic occlusion disease, but it is a technically difficult and demanding and associated with a morbidity. The major limitation of this thoracic aortic bifemoral grafting technique is a morbidity rate associated with a thoracotomy in a relatively highly <laughs> surgery population. And also tunneling in this case is usually a blind procedure. For the cardiothoracic surgeon with experience, use of a descending thoracic aorta could be a very good alternative for infernal aortic occlusion diseases without any morbidity and mortality. Our series demonstrated superior inflow, excellent quality of life, and more reliable patency with uh, this thoraco bifemoral bypass. This approach is recommended in a selected patient when a conventional approach to the abdominal aorta are considered to be hazardous. Thank you very much. Good technique. How? What is the longest follow? -up? Five years. Five years. Yes. What is your anticoagulation strategy? Six months we continue with the warfarin, then just we continue aspirin and stop the warfarin. A good technique. Yes. Well done. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suraj. Our last presentation is by Dr. Sai Sunil R. He'll be presenting on the topic approach in surgeries for coarctation of aorta in adults. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, today, I will be presenting regarding uh, our uh, institution's approach and surgeries for coarctation of aorta in adults. Uh, coarctation of aorta is a predominant disease of childhood, which rarely presents in adults. Adult patients are either uh, asymptomatic or present with uh, uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, options for surgery are limited, uh, uh, mainly due to the large stenosed segment of the aorta and a stiff prea. 
and a stiff pre uh, stiff pre coactation portion of the aorta and a tough post coaction part of the aorta that will be that is usually unavailable for uh, mobilization due to advances in technology catheter and stent based interventions have taken over the role of surgery in such cases uh, but surgery still holds its place in managing such cases uh, while considering surgery the approach of the coax segment is controversial as access to both proximal and distal portion is limited with each technique the distal end organ protection is also challenging uh, we present our experience in 12 adult patients who were operated for coaxation of aorta each patient was given a case wise approach and management since it's difficult to discuss each case individually we would like to summarize our experiences out of the 12 patients which we've done uh, 12 cases which we have done four required additional procedures which were uh, two required in aortic valve replacement one required a vsd a ventricular septal defect uh, repair and one required a bentals procedure and uh, the uniqueness of, of our procedure is of, of our, in our uh, in this series is that uh, uh, out of the 12 uh, coacts which we have done uh, 75% or nine cases we have done under a midline uh, sternotomy and uh, the rest three we have done via lateral thoracotomy Uh, and uh, uh, around 17% that is two patients required a redo surgery uh, in one it was uh, due to a previously subclavian aortoplasty and uh, one patient had uh, a previous vsd closure and uh, and out of and 75% that is nine patients we did it under did it under a cardiopulmonary bypass and the rest under uh, rest we did not do under uh, nine patients and the cannulation techniques uh, 11% of patients we did under axillary and femoral cannulation which is the standard uh, for in our institute and uh, in in 78% we did uh, 78% we did in an aortic and femoral cannulation 11% axillary and femoral cannulation and uh, 11% under only aortic cannulation and the venous cannulation strategy is uh, Uh, we went through a uh, ra appendage uh, venous cannulation except for a case of uh, vst except for the patients which required vst closure where uh, we've done under uh, bicaval cannulation and uh, and uh, out of the we uh, out of those patients uh, three patients we've done under normodermia and uh, five patients we've did uh, we've did it under uh, uh, dhca Uh, with a temperature of 20 degrees and uh, one patient uh, four patients we did on at a temperature of uh, 28 degrees uh, and the surgery the extra anatomical bypass with dacron tube grafts was done in five patients with a proximal end to side uh, side on arch distal end to side on descending thoracic aorta and additional subclavian artery grafting was done in two patients resection with end to end anastomosis was done in three patients resection with end to side anastomosis of the arch of aorta was done in two patients uh, what makes this approach differ, uh, different is that in midline approach once the patient is placed on cardiopulmonary bypass the right pleura is open and the heart is displaced to the right thoracic cavity this accommodates for dissection near the arch of aorta and subclavian artery and distally the posterior uh, pericardium is open to give access for distal anastomosis to the descending thoracic aorta uh this image uh, first the distal anastomosis is performed first with a partial clamp on the anterior uh, wall of the uh, descending thoracic aorta the segment of the aorta is approached and the posterior mediastinum is opened uh, to enter the uh, uh, post uh, to enter the descending thoracic aorta anastomosis may be performed using either a partial clamp uh, or a partial clamp or both aortic and if they if you partial clamp or if you are using a both aortic and femoral cannulation you can use uh, a proximal and distal clamp and this uh, this image shows a proximal anastomosis done under circulatory arrest after looping and snugging the neck vessels and uh, this is an image of pro proximal anastomosis performed via lateral thoracotomy and uh, this is how the graft sorry this is how the graft is seated in the left pleural cavity after completion of the procedure uh post operative results all patients underwent primary closure and we shifted to the icu with minimal inotropic support they were electively ventilated overnight and once extubated rapidly we in the inotropic support uh, one patient who underwent redo surgery for previously operated subclavian aortoplasty developed a post op kyle leak uh, for which pleurovas is done patient recovered Uh, the preoperative gradients across the coax segment was around 46 plus or minus 8 uh, and the post op gradients was averagely around 4.8 plus or minus 
all the patients were followed up for a period of 34 uh, months and they had no short or long term effects and no mortality was noted uh, uh, when patients present with coarctation of adult life in adult life the long standing nature of the disease causes the tissues to be more friable uh, there are large intercostal and collateral arteries uh, that are e that can be easily damaged uh, and the suppleness of the aorta uh, is uh, available for mobilization is lost and there is pre and post aortic dilatation and there is fibrosis of the surrounding tissues and all this makes uh, dissection really hazardous and uh, in addition some cases may be complicated by additional cardiovascular diseases previous surgeries or recurrent diseases so in this era in this era of catheter based interventions anatomical factors and other socio economic considerations and, and availability are also drawn into play in our indian scenario due to the higher rates of recurrence and aneurysm formation associated with endovascular treatments patients treated with this method requires long top follow up so i conclude by saying that coarctation of aorta resection using interposition graft with the cardiopulmonary bypass is recommended for both spinal protection and lower body protection in adult patients with proper planning and case specific approach surgery can be done with acceptable morbidity and no mortality and can deliver a good long term results this is our institute at hyderabad names thank you thank you dr sunil uh, i thank all the moderators who joined us uh, this afternoon for moderating the session dr pradeep okanna dr pankaj gupta dr avi kumar i thank all the presenters and uh, delegates guests in the audience for sparing their valuable time uh, we will be starting session 3 at 2 pm uh, please note there are iacts elections going on in hall a the voting time is between 9 am to 7:30 pm the votings are also happening online thank you everyone uh the lunch will be served uh, here at uh, 130
we have established the cardiopulmonary bypass with aortic and bicaval venous cannulation and cardiac arrest was created with the del nero cardioplegic solution and we have transected the aorta by mm above the sinotubular junction and a pulmonary artery was transected just beneath below its bifurcation and pulmonary valve was examined and it's found to be bicuspid and very much dysplastic and snotic aortic valves were examined and we started harvesting the left coronary button and it was well mobilized and right coronary button was uh, harvested and it was well mobilized after mobilizing the coronary arteries the truncal root incision site was marked all around with a marking pin this is our uh, incision site so we have planned for that and we started incising the truncal block from the anterior wall of the right ventricular outflow tract about 8 mm below the aortic valve annulus and while incising the truncal block we have ensured not to injure the aortic valve cusp and the incision was extended towards the posterior aspect of the right ventricular outflow tract while doing this doing this we have taken care not to injure the any coronary arteries there is a right coronary button and left coronary button was well mobilized after incising the aortic root we started uh, incising the pulmonary root from the left ventricular outflow tract so that the entire truncal block can be excised in n block without any uh, discontinuation between the aortic and the pulmonary root at this site the of uh, incising the pulmonary root we have taken care not to injure the pulmonary mitral curtain to avoid uh, the injury to the mitral annulus this is the place where the mitral pulmonary mitral curtain is uh, located and we have taken care not to injure that we are uh, incising more towards the pulmonary root finally the infundibular septum was incised transversely so that the entire truncal block can be excised a n block the final aspect of incising the infundibular septum so the entire truncal block was excised and it was turned uh, horizontally about 180 degree over the biventricular outflow tract and we have excised the excess part of the infundibular septum and then now the outlet muscular vsd has been examined and it was uh, measured both vertically and horizontally for tailoring the gluteal ligament treated arteriolus pericardium and it was uh, taken and the vsd was uh, sutured with a gluteal ligament treated pericardium with 60 proline continuous fashion the superior aspect of the patch was uh, kept uh, little widen so that we can enlarge the left ventricular outflow tract after suturing the vsd patch we started uh, anchoring the truncal block over the left ventricular outflow tract in such a way that the aortic root is placed over the left ventricular outflow tract we placed uh, horizontal mattress sutures with a pi zero proline uh, totally eight sutures have been taken for suturing the truncal block over the left ventricular outflow tract and these sutures were tightened with a pericardial pledget on either side the coronary sinus opposite to the left coronary button was augmented with a uh, triangular piece of uh, pericardium and uh, we have uh, started suturing the superior aspect of the vst patch to the uh, aortic root and the coronary sinus was augmented with a triangular piece of pericardium this was done to avoid a kinking to the left coronary artery and after augmenting the coronary sinus we have uh, implanted the left coronary button to the augmented sinus with a 70 proline suture now the right coronary button was uh, reimplanted to the opposite sinus with a 70 proline suture after the lecompte maneuver the aortic root was uh, anastomosed to the ascending aorta using a 60 proline continuous fashion now we can uh, since the pulmonary root was a uh, very small in this patient we have decided to enlarge the right ventricular outflow tract with a triangular piece of gluteal ligament treated arteriolus pericardium and we are enlarging the right ventricular outflow tract and we have incised the commissures for uh, enlarging the pulmonary valve 
even after commissure atomy the we are uh, uh, difficult to pass the appropriate size head gas so we planned for trans annular patch after releasing the cross clamp we have cut across the pulmonary annulus and the anterior wall of the pulmonary roots after this the pulmonary uh, continuity was a posterior pulmonary continuity was established after releasing the cross clamp between the pulmonary root and the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery with the 60 proline now the continuity between the pulmonary root and the rvot was established anteriorly we have we have used a bovine pericardial patch to maintain the continuity between the pulmonary artery and the right ventricular outflow tract bovine pericardial patch was sutured to the pulmonary artery with a 60 proline suture continuous fashion and we have used a ptfe membrane for a monocusp wall and the monocusp was sutured to the right ventricular outflow tract intermittently intermittent sutures were taken and this is a final picture of half turn truncal switch operation and the post operative echocardiogram shows a trivial aortic regurgitation and a mild pulmonary regurgitation this is a child and she was extubated on a second post operative day and discharged on a sixth post operative day and she was on follow up for with us for past four months and she is doing well sir so carry on messages it's a very complex procedure with several advantages if any step goes wrong we will end up in a big problem and it needs careful selection of cases thank you so a very nice video you have shown uh, navin uh, what are the advantages you said for selecting half switch over normal sir uh, for for rastely for rastely and uh, nikido uh, might need a redo surgery sir since the child is from a very low socio economic status and they are not affordable for uh, redo surgeries we have explained about the conduit obstruction or left ventricular outflow tract obstruction for this child sir so they are hesitate to go for this redo surgeries so we have planned for the half turn truncal switch sir so anatomy is good in this patient so we have uh, tried for the half turn truncal switch sir Dr. Navin, good presentation. Just I want to ask, uh, do you do it routinely? Uh, these procedures, Nikido and all these things. Sir, rastly we are in our central rastly we are we are doing, sir. Okay. Rastly and rev we are doing. Nikido we are not doing, sir. This is the first case uh, we are doing in our central, sir. Okay. Thank you. Good. Good work. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, we invite Mr. Dr. Anish Gupta for presentation of tetralogy of fellows with single coronary artery with pulmonary embolus, escaping escaping the conduit. Mr. Anish Gupta. So I think that's right. Thank you. 
that is the created out of Sanbari politics. On Kari characterization, apart from your override and EAC, there was unfair proof of branch from Yati. And on your big angiogram, the symbol for the Yati was C, that is the next for the Chinese. On BD angiogram, no major but notable people at this point. On BD angiogram, the patient underwent ultracardic repairs in the short video of the procedure. On opening the pericardial section, an action was utilized. RP was seen arising from the LED and closed to the RP opening and the LED. There were perfect view on the main pulmonary RP, the resistance of inside chamber, and we had three of it to be planned for a conduit visitor because of the anomalous coronary. On opening the pulmonary RP, the cross was removed a little bit towards the chamber, but it did not have to be huge drop of the active mass, which actually was an acute and chronic problem. Pulmonary dial was visualized through the pulmonary RP and was severely chenotic. This uh, this child had uh, tetralogy of aloe and was waiting for surgery due to COVID pandemic, was not operated in time. And meanwhile, uh, on follow-up only, uh, she developed, he developed uh, pulmonary embolism. And this is first thing is pre-op embolism, right? The pre before, embolism, surgery. before surgery. Well, because of what? Uh, maybe because of the hypercoagulable state and just, uh, in uh, polycythemia. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So you removed thrombus a top repair was done and and and, uh, and there was single coronary artery uh, uh, the rc was arising from the left uh, anterior sinus and along with the uh, left left and it was crossing the rvot so we were we had planned for a conduit but we could do trans ra pa repair and uh, uh, we escaped the conduit and we removed the uh, pulmonary thrombus acute okay. and chronic both uh, thrombus was there Child, child is under follow up, and we are giving aspirin. No, no, there also there. Yeah, I think it is the right thing to do, and uh, I think it's a good outcome. Yes. And I think. Uh, Current situation, I think this is the right thing to do. Thank, thank, you. thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Nish, how uh, common is the tetralogy of palate presenting with pulmonary embolism? Do you think? So I, I, we, I have seen it for the first time. That's why it's, we presented. This it is case. very rare, right? Uh, we have also not seen. We were discussing. Yes. Okay. As your topic was a bit uh, confusing. We were just contemplating what does it mean escaping the conduit? Uh, just because we uh, we had planned for a conduit. But if our endless was adequate, so we escaped. We didn't, we didn't put a conduit. So it's good for child. We'll avoid uh, future surgeries. Okay, right. Thank you. I think the presenter has not come. So we'll move on to Dr. Shurbi Bhatnagar. And uh, she will be talking about novel method of coronary translocation in a case of remote origin of anomalous origin of coronary artery from pulmonary artery. Good afternoon, uh, esteemed moderators, my faculty, seniors, and colleagues. Today, uh, my topic is novel method of coronary translocation in a case of remote origin of anomalous origin of the coronary artery from the pulmonary artery. 
in anomalous origin of the left coronary artery to pulmonary trunk that is alcapa the whole of the left main coronary artery or occasionally only the led or the circumflex artery arises uh, anomalously from the proximal pulmonary trunk and rarely from the right proximal pulmonary artery here the right pulmonary artery branches normally and arises from the aorta the branching pattern of both the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery remains normal so it is a rare condition but it is potentially fatal and associated with a high infant mortality and sudden cardiac death at birth the infant is asymptomatic but as the pa pressure decreases during the neonatal period decompensated blood flows under low pressure from the pa via the coronary artery to the left ventricle that means it has uh, coronary steel syndrome and this can lead to severe myocardial ischemia later on there this this uh, predisposes the patients to myocardial ischemia collateral vessels develop between the right and left coronary arteries which are absolutely essential for survival and may provide adequate perfusion of the left ventricular myocardium in this case it was a right dominant circulation it had a huge right coronary artery and there were multiple collaterals present subsequently the pulmonary uh, vascular resistance decreases and a retrograde flow from high pressure coronary arteries to the pulmonary trunk results in myocardial steel syndrome and contributes to myocardial ischemia over time there is anterolateral myocardial infarction there can be mitral valve dysfunction uh, leading to mitral uh, valve regurgitation and uh, congestive cardiac failure uh, the presenting features are paroxysms of irritability which contribute with episodes of angina pectoris and symptoms of heart failure so uh, we have uh, presented a patient a 10 year old male patient who came with shortness of breath on exertion and fatigue since 2 years examination relieve relieve uh, revealed a continuous murmur present over the left upper sternal edge electrocardiogram was done but it showed normal sinus rhythm there were no q wave or stt segment changes chest x ray showed marked cardiomegaly and pulmonary venous congestion all routine lab investigations were normal a trans thoracic echocardiogram which was done revealed a moderate lv dysfunction mitral regurgitation was absent we did a cardiac catheterization as well as angiogram which revealed alcapa and it demonstrated the absence of the main left coronary artery from the aorta it arose from the right from the main uh, pulmonary trunk the right coronary artery was considerably enlarged it was tortuous and it perfused the left main coronary artery via extensive collaterals so there were extensive intraseptal collaterals present there was a retrograde flow from the left coronary artery to the pulmonary artery interpretive findings this was a unique case because uh, normally the left coronary artery the anomalous left main coronary artery arises from the right aspect of the pulmonary trunk towards the aorta or less commonly from the posterior trunk of the pulmonary trunk in this way it is easier to perform tra coronary translocation in this case but in this case it arose 180 degrees opposite to the aorta it means that the uh, anomalous left main coronary artery was present towards the left side making simple coronary translocation difficult so the surgical technique that was employed was coronary translocation was done by extending the origin of the left main anomalous coronary artery from the pulmonary artery towards the aorta by forming a tube out of the walls of the pulmonary artery and repairing the pulmonary artery with untreated native myocardium yeah. so is the so as we can see this is the left main coronary artery towards the left which is arising from the left aspect of the uh, from the pulmonary trunk the, it's huge we can also see a highly tortuous right coronary artery arising from the aorta this is a right coronary artery which is highly tortuous huge we are separating the tissue around the pulmonary artery on either sides here yeah. so we give two parallel incisions over the pulmonary trunk this is the first parallel incision just above the pulmonary wall after opening this we assess the coronary ostium this is the second parallel incision which is taken this is the anterior incision taken over the pulmonary trunk so now we have two parallel incisions both the incisions are around half centimeters away from the coronary left ostium so we make we uh, extend these incisions sideways make a tube out of the walls of the pulmonary artery as seen here
this uh, procedure is uh, interesting and important because uh, it involves only the native vascular tissue the whole uh, tube is formed by the pulmonary artery so the whole uh, native vascular tissue is involved which has good growth potential some surgeons prefer to have one uh, wall the anterior wall as a pulmonary artery and the posterior wall as a pericardium but there are chances of fibrosis the pericardium can undergo fibrosis and that's why we did not use this method now we have uh, two lateral margins which are formed from those uh, incisions and now we are suturing this with 70 polypropylene sutures the length of this uh, graft this tube graft the length is equal to the diameter of the pulmonary artery so therefore uh, it it easily uh, reach the iota and uh, the width of this graft is equal to the coronary ostium in this case it must be around 1 cm so the coronary ostium is around 1 cm and we have taken an incision two incisions half cm from either side and that half cm from either side is used to suture the lateral margins now we have reached the proximal end of uh, this tube as we can see we have uh, placed a bulldog clamp underneath and now we have reached the proximal end now we will anastomose this end to the iota so we have created a an opening just on the left uh, lateral aspect of the iota adjacent to the main pulmonary artery by a punch hole and now we'll be anastomosing this uh, tube graft proximal end of the tube graft to the iota to 70 polypropylene sutures in this uh, situation because uh, there is a highly remote origin uh, of the left and omnis coronary artery we could have done a tatiochi repair as well which is intra pulmonary tunnel but we avoided that because there is a possibility of uh, graft uh, compression if pa pressures rise if pa pressures rise because uh, nowadays these patients usually have lv dysfunction so when pa pressures rise the graft can get compressed as it's an intra pulmonary tunnel So here we are anastomosing both the ends. So the interesting part of uh, and the unique original uh, part of this uh, method is that all the walls of the graft they are composed of the pulmonary artery. We have not used any pericardium. now uh, this is the we'll be repairing the deficient wall of the pulmonary trunk there because the anterior wall and the posterior wall have been used forming this anastomosis this graft so we'll be uh, repairing the deficient uh, anterior wall of the pulmonary trunk using native liberal pericardium of the patient this is a native liberal pericardium untreated pericardium of the patient and we'll be anastomosing that and reconstructing uh, the bridge and reconstructing and bridging the gap that was deficient in the pulmonary artery post operative course it was uneventful total icu stay was 2 days post operatively and uh, the patient was discharged on the 7th post operative day post operative ct itogram at one year follow up showed patency of the pulmonary artery tube graft and no evidence of narrowing at the anastomotic site thank you nice presentation dr shubhi uh, one thing i want to know uh, do you uh, how you protect the myocardium in these patients but uh, myocardial yes, protection is yes, important sir, yes, in rcapa yes sir yes we uh, we first have done iota cannulation as well as ra venous cannulation and after that we have cross clamped both the iota as well as the pulmonary artery and given cardioplegia both in the uh, iota as well as the pulmonary artery and the cardioplegia in both uh and the next question is what do you think about the direct implantation of the coronary artery most of the 
uh, uh, this anomalous ostia arise from the posterior sinus and but we have yes. seen in our experiences that yes, they can be directly implanted in most of the cases we usually do not uh, uh, need to make any tube or use any pericardium you can just mobilize it and it can be directly implanted and maybe an ortic flap may be used this is the technique we use to use uh, why you decided to use a uh, this uh, pericard uh, pulmonary artery tube uh, because of the location of the normalis coronary artery sir it was exactly 180 degrees uh, away from the aorta and we were not sure if we would we could extend uh, the the left anomalous coronary artery there would have caused a lot of tension and mobilization would have been difficult so this was more uh, i agree your fears these are the most common fears we have but but we have observed that we can use okay. it directly implant it hmm? okay. thank you thank you very much hello hello ready nano first plate uh any questions for this video session from audience Okay. So, uh, for the next session, uh, uh, moderators are Dr. Uh, Pankaj Agarwal and Dr. Uh, Mawar Sab, please, and uh, <coughs> Dr. Um, um, uh, Dr. Vinod Gupta. Where is the Vinod Gupta? <coughs> Dr. Rajesh. Dr. Rajesh, please share share the session. Come. Okay. Session number thirty one. Uh, design of total cavopulmonary junction for the optimized hemodynamics. Dr. Sanjeev Desrao. Yes. Please start slides. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm a cardiac surgeon, but uh, diverted into a research. and uh, for that i did engineering i did uh, masters and phd in engineering from iit bombay okay so what i am presenting is some part of the work which i did during my phd period uh, can we start first so, uh, i think uh, you know the total cavopulmonary connection which is very co surgery commonly done for single ventricle so uh, this slides i'll go just very fast uh, this is biventricular uh, normal heart and other is a single ventricular heart so for this we do a cavopulmonary connection and uh, uh, this also intraatrial extra cardiac conduits everybody knows this so normal circulation how does it go it's a serial circulation and uh, the aorta body vena cava back to the right uh, right side of the heart whereas in a single ventricle it is a parallel circulation so uh, because of a parallel circulation we get a ventricular overload uh, fluid overload there it has to pump twice repeatedly it has to pump so we need to convert into again back to a serial circulation and that is what is achieved by doing a fontan circulation or total cavopulmonary uh, circulation so this is uh, another schematic which explains how uh, single ventricular circulation is converted into uh, serial circulation by doing total cavopulmonary connection so this uh, you can see the tcp total cavopulmonary connection junction the venous return from from svc and ivc it is connected to right pulmonary artery from top and bottom and it creates a plus like uh, configuration so now what is the motivation for doing this research work so this research work normally what happens is after some time after doing it at total cavopulmonary connection the patient's hemodynamics starts uh, deteriorating the venous side pressure starts increasing and what is the reason for that the reason is mostly it is a power loss at the junction of total cavopulmonary connection because the stream from svc and ivc they are hitting each other and then they are going towards uh, lungs so at the junction there is a lot of power loss or we can say energy loss 
so we will see this terms what is energy loss power loss or pressure loss and how do we uh, understand this terms from engineering point of view the other problem uh, of uh, uh, mal configured total capillary connection junction is many times ivc blood is diverted into one side of to one side of the lungs and other side doesn't reach and this blood which is coming from liver the part of a liver, uh, hepatic return comes via ivc it goes to only one lung and other lung is deprived of it and that's how the other lung develops ab malformations uh, causing cyanosis and a uh, lot of complications so uh, this is how you develop a uh, <coughs> pulmonary ab malformations so what we need to do is we need to design this the tcpc junction so i'm, I'm looking at the engineering uh, design of uh, this total cavity pulmonary connection uh, at the 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 center of the tcpc okay these are the complications due to av malformation so for what we do is we do a laboratory models first we do a laboratory model. we create a something like simple uh, designs where is a plus structure is it is made so uh, this left side of this slide it shows Uh, we introduce the flows from svc and ivc this is a steady flow of course you can introduce pulsatile flow also and the uh, right side also shows the another um, um, picture where you can see the setup which is been fed in uh, which is fed by the flow from uh, svc and ivc so here uh, here this is the uh, slide it shows what i have done is in this uh, left side of this slide i have inserted a horizontal plate at the center of total capillary connection so you can call it as a baffle which what it does is it doesn't allow the stream from svc and ivc to hit hit each other and we'll see uh, we'll i'll try to explain this in the next slides so uh, since this is a quite a large study i've just taken a picked up a few things uh, from this study i tried different different to change the central um, center by various ways so this is uh, a computational study so what does this computational study means so what we do is we create a, a physical structure in the computer and i can introduce the flow from svc and ivc of whatever 1 liter 2 liter i can give the flows and what kind of flow it will be everything i can specify and ask the computer to find out how it is Uh, how it is going to flow in the center so this is what we call as a computational study so the, this is the experiments which we can do without you know setting up any laboratory it is only software based and they give a pretty accurate results so so few of those st studies i am showing next oh, yeah so here you can see the two different type of you know baffles one is a curved baffle which is curved at two places one is a single curved uh, baffle and it shows how the bl blood will flow at the center if you put this kind of a baffle in the center here uh, you can see the uh, the three types of you know centers which i have created one is totally <coughs> offset it is a full offset Uh, svc is on one side and ivc blood is going on other side so what happens if you do like this so uh, if there is a full offset I, ivc blood will go on only one side and at the center there will be a vortex so uh, if the, let's suppose if such kind of uh, we get a patient which is already done in total capillary connection with asymmetric asymmetric or offset connection so how do how do we can correct it so i just tried whether we can put a curd Uh, partition and we can correct the flow so these are the various experiments so i'll summarize at the end now here we can see uh, there is no partition now flow is coming from the top and bottom when they hit each other the flow starts swirling so it's uh, it gets curved flow on both side it is mixing and uh, you can see the swirls and you can imagine the kind of uh, power loss which is happening in this situation so this can be avoided by just simply putting 
horizontal baffle uh, at the center of total cow probability connection. So the, uh, the, the large number of experiments were done with different different kind of models, and I'm just showing very few of the few of them. This is one of the um, early uh, experiment which I did. These are these are the another uh, the two experiments where I used a uh, flow measuring and uh, pressure measuring devices, what is sensitive devices, and I try to see how much is the pressure loss. So pressure loss is indirect representation of a power loss. So a little bit about a power loss. Uh, power loss is like whenever the heart pumps up blood and which starts traveling down the aorta. So at each uh, distance of travel, it loses its energy. So that is what we, in engineering terms, we call it as a power loss and we measure it in terms of a watts. So whatever the heart provides, let's suppose two watts of uh, energy. So by the time it comes back, it would have spent almost all the energy. And here, the left side of this uh, picture, you can see a model which is created by digit, uh, digital printing or 3D printing, wherein I can insert a baffle and take it out. So I can do a study with baffle and without baffle. This is another uh, uh, experiment which I did where I introduced the pulsatile flow into the model. So uh, I can conclude. Uh, briefly conclude my uh, work into these two things. For first time surgery, if you are doing a total cow pulmonary connection, the junction should be properly designed geometrically and um, uh, maybe with, with some baffle or design itself can be such that the SVC and IVC flow doesn't collide with each other. Then when there we, we see a patient who is having uh, inefficient junction, so the correction of the junction can be done by a customized baffle and which can be inserted to correct the hemodynamics in such patients. Can I show the video? Can you? Huh. I just show you the video the, where we can also see how the, uh, it's a simulation video, how, how the blood will flow with you know, different, different uh, geometries. So you, this is how the simulation looks like. So for with every kind of configuration, I will try and see how the, the blood would flow in terms of like what we call is a particle flow. So how it will flow. This is totally done on a computer. So, so not only does a, a computer does a simulation like this, but it also tells how much you know, pressure uh, gradient it will form, how much energy will be lost at what each stage at each millimeter we can calculate at each millimeter cross section how the energy is losing in what rate it is losing so uh, this is a very powerful tool computational tool which we can apply for not only uh, this for any of the cardiovascular problems okay so i uh, end my talk on this topic now and uh, i would like to switch to the next paper Okay, I would like to ask one question. What were the complications you have faced in your study and how did you manage? So what are the? What are the complications you have faced in your study? Complications and how did you manage? So complications because of? Yes, baffle. Complication because of baffle. Yes. Yeah, of course, baffle can introduce. Uh, there can be some region of you know low flows where you can get a clotting. Uh, also, baffle if it is wrongly designed, it can cre create more energy loss. So uh, definitely, both the complications can arise. So uh, designing a baffle is very important. So that's what is the engineering uh, exercise. Is it designed by you only, or is custom? No, it's a, this was designed by me only. So this is the first time this kind of work has been done by me. So this was done as a part of a PhD work. So uh, this concept I'm introducing is the first time. Okay, you are yeah, I, I, I tried to, uh, I'm the, tried to get a patent for this, uh, this concept.
have you uh, has it been uh, in vivo be uh, you have tried something in vivo vivo i have not uh, tried but i am going to do vivo uh, you are planning yeah, to I do the studies in that yeah i am going to do vivo yes okay it is yeah. uh, it will be interesting to know how the befl will work actually yes that yeah that is that will be exciting yes Prediction of coronary hemodynamics in post multivessel CABG using computation, computational analysis. Yes. So this topic, uh, uh, this is a this topic is itself is a new for me, and uh, of course th there are a lot of areas in this topic are uh, my area of expertise. So I'll explain this topic. what happens is uh, in multi vessel stenosis we, uh, we try to put a graft on each vessel and early and already the nature has established some collaterals so how the collaterals are likely to affect our uh, our graft flow through the graft affect our graft means the flow through the graft so uh, so uh, what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to predict the flow through the graft or the graft behavior so now the collateral circulation in coronary network it is uh, it is more pronounced in most of the stenotic diseases so this is a contribution from nature and we are trying to provide a uh, blood flow to the uh, distal to the blockage by our graft so we have to consider what the nature is doing or are we computing it or how do we go along with the nature so putting the grafts by following the uh, the nature's flow is very important and that's what i'm trying to see how how does it impact the collateral circulation how does it impact our grafting procedures so uh, basically what we have to understand is a competitive flow when distal uh, distal bed is the same and there are two sources of blood flow to the same bed so this two uh, uh, two flows which going to the same bed they are going to compete with each other and the one which has got a higher uh, energy that is going to preside over the other graft same thing uh, what we would have observed in uh, tcpc also so just going referring back to tcpc suppose there is ivc uh, icc the two flows are there and ivc let's suppose we put up pump or something access device or something so that uh, flow from the ivc it will not let the svc flow to come in so similarly what can happen is suppose we put a two grafts on om and lad a uh, uh, neighboring regions and um, there is a flow from uh, collateral flow from lad to uh, om in a very large quantity so it will not allow the graft to work so uh, how do we uh, this is naturally anybody can uh, uh, imagine this and uh, the moment the velocity in the graft comes down to comes down below critical level the graft is likely to close because the velocity is below critical uh, crit critical level so here we are going to understand few things and why this topic is new why, why i am saying this topic is new for me uh, so now flow in the coronary vessel is basically that's what i said is is going to determine by the impedance of the the bed so the aim is to predict impact of collateral circulation on coronary circulation now if the graft is upstream it will enhance the collateral circulation so that is what suppose we put a now in the collateral circulation it is is of course the, is because it's a flow it is going from one region to another region so there is an upstream and there is a downstream so if you put a graft at the upstream side it is going to help but if you put on downstream side it is going to compete so that is what i am trying to explain and uh, of course this is the aim of this paper is how do we uh, predict this now if the down, downstream flow is there then definitely it is going to compete Okay. so here this simple example you can see there is 70% block in led or uh, circumflex there is a 90% block so the 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 collateral flow 
the upstream graph to the upstream side and graph to the downstream side you can understand this so now what how do we quantify first of all let's come to the very fundamental thing how do we quantify a stenosis normally we see angiogram and we say 70% block 80% block but is that um, uh, is, is it a critical evaluation of course not because every lesion every stenosis has got some length some irregular area inside the lumen and uh, irregular diameter across the uh, stenosis stenotic length so all it is going to affect so when we sum up all these things so it it is some does a like a lesion is giving going to give us some resistance some resistance to the flow so uh, how do we measure this resistance so this resistance is normally we say find out by the how much pressure drop will take place at certain flow that is uh, normally referred as a ffr flow uh, fractional flow reserve and which is done in by using a catheters but with the computational advances we can with the computational uh, estimate we can find out how how much uh, there is going to be a pressure drop without measuring without putting a catheter that is how this hard flow company is doing so this is, comes in a the computational work which i i showed in a total cavapulmonary connection but now here it is not the only uh, is the stenotic region or stenotic area but now how do we assess the bed how do we assess the microcirculation because that cannot be uh, uh, taken up into the computer as an a uh, physical uh, uh, geometry because it's too complicated highly branched structures uh, so it's very difficult to represent into the computer so to represent into the computer what we do is uh, we put in terms of a uh, this into the in terms of electrical parameters so we just sum up everything in terms of resistance impedance and uh inertia inertial component so these three components we sum up now here routine cfd approach cannot be applied so small vessel network impossible to represent in terms of a geometry so what we do is a lump parameter approach is used and electrical circuit theory is applied to estimate the parameters such as flow and pressure so uh, basically this is a simple uh, sir, uh, diagram i am show showing where you put a resistance and capacitance so of course we, are, we can put a inertial uh, component also and see how a pulsatile flow will change after some distance so uh, these are the main terms the impedance or resistance the impedance whenever there is a pulsatile flow we call it as an impedance so in uh, we have got a, always in body it's an impedance and uh, because it is a pulsatile we have got a, not only uh, velocity we have got a phase lag also so the two things capacitance and inductance inductance is a, in a electrical term whereas in fluid mechanics we call it as an inertia so this capacitance and inertia they uh, change the pulse wave into a different uh, pulse wave which has got a there is a lag in time as well as phase in and also amplitude so uh, quantification of a collateral contribution so that is a very difficult task how do we quantify this how much collateral contribution is uh, there are a lot of papers and a lot of research work has been done so few of them i'm just quoting is uh, intra coronary attenuation based uh, is based on uh, ct uh, ct angiography then uh, that is what we ca calculate is the transluminal attenuation gradient then there are uh, also we can uh, use catheters to find a coronary flow and uh, pressures so by measuring coronary wedge pressure and central venous pressure we can find out uh, how much is collateral influence of collateral circulation is there okay so these are some of these technologies which can be used for to assess a collateral circulation and this assessment need to be taken into the computation so what we so what we uh, put a coronary circulation this is also very small part of um, uh, coronary circuit which is shown in terms of electrical uh, circuits and um, here we need to feed the aortic pressure aortic flows and uh, also collateral uh, some of the uh, numbers which we get from collateral assessment to find out how it, how much it will be a flow through the graft so it's necessary so uh, i would like to conclude so it's necessary to predict impact of cabg so i have to take a right decision the pressure flow stenosis data to be obtained at the beginning of the surgery and simulation is done to predict the graft flow rate 
and also we need to see uh, check it whether our predictions are correct or not so initially uh, in this research work there are a lot of um, um, uh, feedback and uh, correction it will go on to achieve a per the perfect uh, programs which can predict uh, more accurately the results of uh, cng so i would like to thanks for the uh, listening to the my two papers and um, so a lot of people have been involved in uh, my research work so there are many many i could not um, i cannot like list them uh, uh, many professors and um, a lot of uh, fellow research scholars they have contributed to this work and they keep uh, contributing voluntarily most of this work uh, this kind of research work hardly it's not paid research so uh, most of the contribution comes as a voluntary basis so i thank you everybody who has uh, contributed to this uh, work thank you uh, doctor i just uh, i wanted to know uh, in simple terms how you will do it uh, in clinically uh, this uh, ffr how you will uh, you will do it through computational analysis you mean to say you have developed the software which yeah, you yeah, I'm, I'm, i'm developing the software it's a, it's quite a beginning uh, stage but few volunteers have joined me and um, we started working on this okay yes uh, then it's so be put to clinical use yes uh, like in india this trend is not there engineering research applied to clinical it is not there like this I am trying to apply whatever the possible engineering to the applicant. It's direct application of clinical side. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the single ventricle total capillary connection is also. It, I would like to apply it clinically. Uh, I see a good feasibility of doing it uh, in a clinical way. So after animal experimental, it will be clear how how we can do it. However, this software also can be tried before starting a CBG. We can take the data. and uh, try to predict and uh, see whether prediction comes true because now we can uh, measure the graph flow with uh, devices so it's possible to check how what we are doing and how we can predict okay right thank you Dr. Pradeep Kumar. No, sir. Uh, Dr. Chirag will be presenting next. Dr. Dr. Chirag Sumitra. Yes, sir. Okay. A novel technique of implementing uh, hydro dissection in chronic pulmonary endarterotomy. And thank you very much, Dr. Sanjeev Desra, for presenting a very nice. Information shared with us. I am Dr. Chirag from Jaydeva Institute, and uh, my topic today is a novel technique of implementing hydro dissection in pulmonary endarterotomy for CTPH. So, <clears throat> the surgical pulmonary endarterotomy is a gold standard modality of management for the chronic for the CTPH. The different methods have been described so far. Uh, in a landmark study of Madani and Jamison, they have used uh, Madani's pulmonary endarterotomy forceps, Jamison's sucker dissector, and even some articles have showed a use of spatulas and pediatric sucker. The raising the proper plane of dissection between the thrombosed intimal layer and the media is the essential part of the surgery. The hydro dissection is one of the known and simple and a simple technique followed in a cataract surgeries, in a ENT surgeries for the ranular excision. and neurological surgeries in in cases of prosthetic for the creative for the creation of safe plane of dissection okay these are the instruments uh, which i just mentioned the first four are uh, the madani retractors the next the fifth one is uh, from left to right is the jamison uh, sucker dissector then long artery forceps next slide Okay, our method methodology includes uh, we had operated uh, three cases with uh, this technique of hydro dissection. We have complicated the principles of standard pulmonary endarterotomy, described like a bilateral approach and endarterotomy specimen until the tailing off of the specimen, 
and we use low flows or TCF during the endo dissection. The endo dissection has been uh, described in cardiac surgeries uh, for coronary endo for the LAD mainly, lima assisting and uh, redo cardiac surgery to create a retrosural plane. Our attempt is to show the benefit of endo dissection in achieving a safe and correct plane of dissection to procure the endo specimen. And we are also used uh, CO2 mist blower, which we use, commonly use in uh, opcap surgeries for a total or adequate clearance from the pulmonary thrombus burden. So our surgical technique includes uh, a standard midline sternotomy, a systemic apparentization, iota by cable cannulation, and we cool the patient usually to a 25 degree. And if it is required, we will go further. And uh, both the branch PS are dissected up to the hilar branch without breaching the pleura. The iotic uh, cross clamp is applied and myocardial uh, protection is given to the del nido, anterior root plegia and along with the topical pulling. And LV is vented to the RSPV. So the instruments, what we use is, first is uh, the, uh, the rib retractors, a single blade pediatric retractors, which is used to retract the iota and SVC for the, uh, mainly for the RPA dissection. And the pediatric suckers, then two long Debeke forceps. And we can see the, we use a, uh, a 20 gauge or 18 gauge Wygon catheter for the creation of uh, plane in the hydro, hydro dissection and uh, CO2 mist blower. So in our technique, uh, we use two 5 proline traction sutures are taken on the planned incision part, which is usually preferably soft and yielding to pressure. We use 15 number blade to score the expo score and uh, expose the endothelium. Uh, a similar technique which is used for aortic cannulation, a plane, a plane between the inner intimal and outer media and uh, adventation layer is further dissected bluntly using a spatula. Whenever there is a calcification, we continued with a sharp dissection. Once there is a enough space created, a pediatric arterial catheter of 20 gauge Wygon is passed in that plane and connected to the 10 cc syringe filled with a heparin saline. A saline is injected until there is a loss of resistance under the vision taking care not to breach the endothelium. Next slide. Okay, this is the intraoperative image. In the first, you can see the we are uh, after the 50 after the initial incision on the uh, uh, PA. We are creating a plane using a, a spatula, and once the enough plane has been created, we can see the Wygon catheter has been passed, and saline is injected, creating a plane between the endothelium and outer media and adventitia complex. Next slide. Oh. This hydro dissection is carried over circumferentially, alternating the use of spatula. And uh, a superficial incision is extended up to the lower lobal branch with a pot scissor. The areas of fibrosis and calcification may require a sharp dissection intermittently. A CO2 mist blower used in op cap surgery has an atraumatic tip, which can be used for the blunt dissection also. And also, we can use that steady water jet for the dissection in the distal end of the PA in separating the thrombus endothelium from the medial layer. So, these are the images showing the usage of CO2 mist blower. And in the last slide, we can see a good plane has been created between the thrombus and the outer adventitia part. Next. Once the segmental branches are reached, a specimen is opened and uh, we, we go on low flows and uh, at times if required, even a TCA and it is timed. The endodectomy specimen is held by our DBK forceps and the rest of the specimen is harvested by the standard eversion technique with the help of, uh, with the help of forceps and also with the hydrojet of CO2 mist blower. The dissection is carried until the tailing of the endodectomy once the dissection is completed, the perfusion flows can be resumed and branch PAs are closed in two layers using 6 o proline suture. Each branch PA endotectomy needs a bloodless field of, on an average of 10 to 11 minutes. 
The post operatively, the pa patients are managed in a routine way with adequate dialysis, early extubation, anticoagulation, and antiplatelet therapy. After the discharge, these patients are followed up uh, on the OPD basis and on a regular basis, uh, assessing the, the symptoms, RV dysfunction, tricuspid regurgitation status, pH by endo echocardiogram. These are our results. We have operated three patients with the age of 43, 36, and 53 years. All are male patients. Our maximum required uh, TCA was around 12 minutes and the minimum of around seven minutes. Usually our hospital stay varies between eight to 10 days. And uh, the longest follow-up patients is presently at uh, 12 months. All three patients had a severe RV dysfunction, severe pH, and severe TR preoperatively, which refers to the mild pH, mild TR, and implored RV functions postoperatively. With the uh, implement in the symptoms, they were with the NYHA class three before preoperatively, and right now one to two. Uh, all three patients had an uneventful post-op recovery, none of them requiring a redo surge, reopening for bleeding. Present all are under follow-up right now. So articles from Jason and Madani discuss the technique of pulmonary endarterectomy with complete and adequate pulmonary artery clearance using a dedicated instruments like Jameson's aspirator, dissector, and application of Madani process. The choice of initiating a plane of dissection is after the opening the branch PA under TCA, and it is started at a posterior wall of the PA, posterior superior wall of the PA. Our technique uses an arterial Vigon catheter to create a plane of dissection along the anterior surface of the PA by a hydro dissection without opening the PA, and this avoids the duration of low flows while creating the plane until, until we reach the low bar segments. So this hydro dissection is uh, described by Ali Azari in his one of his case reports using a 16 number uh, angel catheter, but he used a 700 ml normal saline uh, packet uh, to create a plane uh, and his space uh, and his specimen uh, took uh, was only the RPA. Our technique is an attempt to improvise the endotectomy with a minimal TC and easy entry into the correct plane of dissection. The principle of hydro dissection and application of CO2 mist blower uh, used modern uh, commodity in the off pump CABG for a distal and uh, it is mainly used for a distal dissection and segmental dissection. So, concluding this. This novel technique helps us to achieve a quick, safe, and complete excision of a chronic thrombus from the pulmonary arterial tree. The additional instrument used in the technique are available in all the surgery, surgical OTs doing the opcab in our country. This study further needs the inclusion of more cases of similar technique for confirmation of further safety and reproducibility. Thank you. It is a, a new technique, I will say. We have not done using uh, uh, under technique using the hydro dissection. Uh, does the flap uh, uh, gives way in between? Also, you have seen some cases like. So, in all our three cases, the flap has not given away. Okay. Yeah, and uh, usually we use the, the forceps or the arterial for long artery forceps. It is based on the how uh, the based on the specimen. If you feel the specimen may give away, we are even used sponge holding for catheter, sponge holding forceps. In one case, we are used even uh, a snare, uh, a sixoproline is being taken and we snare with a rubber, uh, rubber catheter and we are used to hold it. So yeah, in all the three cases, we have never encountered the giving away of the space. And once we reach the lobar segment, we electively open to reconfirm that we are in a correct place and continue with a, a standard Eversion technique. Um, until you reach the tiling of a system. And, uh, TCA, you need to go to see the lobar branches? Yes, sir. Okay, right. It's a good technique, but we need to use it before saying more about it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, there are two more presentations by Dr. Raja Lahiri. He'll be joining us online through Zoom. Good evening. 
Uh, welcome, Dr. Raja Rahiri. Can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Good evening. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Uh, you can uh, play the pre-recorded presentation, and I can take the questions at the end.
Hello, Dr. Raja. Hello, sir. I just want to ask you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes, sir. We can hear. I can hear you. Ah, hello. Want, hello. Yes, I can hear you, sir. Okay. I just want to ask you. Are using RA appendage? Yeah, RA wall for ostium secondary VSD closure. So, what right, you are sir. doing for RA defect? So I am closing the defect primarily uh, for achieving a primary closure. What I am doing is I am adding another incision towards the R appendage and trying to do a sliding of the margins so that I can achieve a tension-free primary uh, repair of the RA defect. In most of these patients uh, with large OSASD, the RA size is already enlarged. So kind of it also helps in decreasing the RA size and also we can achieve a primary closure of the uh, defect that's created in the RA wall. So you are reconstructing the RA wall without using any pericardium or anything? No, no, no pericardium is used. The objective of this technique is to use native tissue, RA tissue, and that, that is well vascularized, like with the pedicle, with intact vascularity and intact function. Okay. okay. Your next topic is effect of necorandial therapy in periodication well. and quality of life indicators in patient with peripheral arterial disease. Can we have the presentation? Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Raja. You have mentioned that you are this last jolly associated with some unwanted drug reactions. Drug yes, effects. Sir. Hello. Yes, sir. You have mentioned in your slides that last jolly is associated with some unwanted drug effects. Right, sir. What if drug adverse effects you have seen? The most of the patients with celestazole complain with uh, throbbing headache, which they, uh, even with a very small dose of celestazole, they uh, complain of headaches, frequent headaches. And uh, some also complain of hot flushes associated with celestazole. The objective of my study was not to like prove that nicorandel is better than celestazole. But uh, with nicorandel, like first of all, nicorandel has never been tried in peripheral vascular disease. And the beauty of this study was that with established doses, which are already been established as safe for anti anginal doses, with those doses, patients have been getting benefit. And those benefits were uh, much better with minimum side effects in those patients. Also, because these peripheral artery disease patients also have risk for coronary artery disease. So it will kind of, because of its uh, change in the endothelial function adaptations and uh, the uh, coronary dilatation, it will uh, offer additional protection to the heart as well as symptom relief in the peripheral vessels. And we could find a tremendous increase in the stodication distance in the patients, especially in patients with severe agonizing rest pains. Those patients were totally symptom free after starting nicorandel therapy. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you all the participants. I thank all the moderators for sparing their valuable time. Uh, I also want to thank all the members in the audience uh, for being here. Uh, this uh, We end the session now. Thank you.